Shalom. My name is Malika. I am the owner of Nuts About Butters and you are now tuned in to Maccabees TV. I am also proud to announce that we do have a new channel. It's called Sisters of the Maccabees. It is a channel for the sisters. Okay, so tuned in, subscribe. The link will be down in the description box. Shalom. Shalom, Shalom, Shalom family. Welcome to another edition of Maccabees TV. It's your brother, Priest Daniel Allah, with a quick announcement. In our never-ending quest to bring our people quality information, powerful and life-changing information, we introduce two new channels to the Maccabees family. Currently, we have Maccabees TV, and we have the Sisters of the Maccabees channel. We're going to introduce two new channels very soon. One of them is called Maccabees TV News which is basically going to be news and current events as it relates to prophecy. And also, we're introducing Maccabees TV music to try and help and push to the masses the Israelite artists that are out here and get their music to where people can hear it. If there's anything that we do on any of these channels that impact and help you, and you feel in your heart that you want to help us, please become a Patreon today. I'm not asking for every subscriber to become a Patreon, but if there's something that we do that helps you and you feel like you want to help us, as some people have reached out to me and said, become a Patreon today. As a thank you for becoming a Patreon today, I will ship you a DVD hard copy of the Exodus Memorial that we did two years ago, and I'll also be uploading exclusive footage on our Patreon channel. So again, if anything that we do impacts you and you want to help, become a Patreon today. With that, I say peace and shalom to the nation of Israel. Shalom, 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 family. Appreciate y'all coming in today, you know, checking out this video, man, because there's been a lot going on. You know. But, you know, first and foremost, want to give praise and honor to the creator. And he that intercesses on my behalf, Yeshua HaMashiach. And you know, man, it's been a crazy weekend down here in Houston, man. Shoot, uh, y'all all know about Hurricane Harvey and stuff, man. But I just want to say, you know, us here in Houston, we straight. You know what I'm saying? I stay close to the downtown area and in the 16 loop, and we straight. You know, uh, the way the freeways made, you know, they made to take in a whole lot of water and act like another bio in order to save our houses from flooding. So it was a good thing that they held up. Uh, the levees, you know, they had the uh, at the reservoir, they had to leak it a little bit. You know, it flooded out a few people's houses, not too much, not too bad. But it was a call that they had to make because if they didn't, you know, and the levee would have broke, shoot, we would have lost probably the south side of Houston. You know what I'm saying? And uh, a lot of people was big um, on, you know, kind of talking bad to the, on the mayor and stuff about, you know, the call he made. But uh Anybody who live here know, man, it take days to evacuate Houston. You know what I'm saying? We talking about, you know, five million people on the books, probably an extra two off. You know, I mean, you, you're not going to evacuate Houston in a few hours. And we talking about a, a flash flood that was supposed to come with Hurricane Harvey. You know what I'm saying? It just it was going to be any moment. And it really came like that. You know what I'm saying? So if people would have been out there on that road, you know, out there trying to get by, they would have been thousands of people who would have died and they would have just drowned in their cars because the freeways would have took all the water, you know, and then people would have been stuck on the freeway drowning in their cars, you know, and stuff like that. So, you know, tough call to make, but, you know, it was the right call to make in the long run, you know, but uh, even with all that being said, you know, uh, those we really need to be praying for and uh, trying to help and reaching out to help with those who are closer to the Gulf, you know, down there in Corpus, you know, those just south of Houston, you know, they took it rough. They took it real hard. You know, uh, I think the death toll when I checked yesterday was like up to 10 people, which, you know, thank God it ain't more. You know what I'm saying? Because it could have been way worse than what it was. But, you know, those areas evacuated here in Houston, you know, George R. Brown Convention Center. We taking on a lot of these people. We taking them in, you know, trying to help them out. Uh, they offering jobs out here for people who looking, you know what I'm saying? You get paid to help people. So, you know, they got some that's a thousand dollars a week to come help and clean up after the hurricane, some 2000 a week. But uh, you need to hurry up and sign up because I think it's over like next week. At the end of next week, they no longer taking people who trying to sign up for. It. But uh, 
yeah, with all that going on in Houston, you know, uh, I've been trapped in the house, you know, for a whole weekend. So it really gave me some time to finish up this presentation that I've been trying to get together, you know what I'm saying, and get out there to uh, Daniela from Maccabees TV because I know <laughs> – I told you I was going to have it out to you about two, three weeks ago, man. My bad. You know, I'll be busy, but I'm trying to get this in because I know the people need that information. So um, what we got to deal with here is, man, it's, it's just been some crazy stuff going on in the community, you know, uh, coming from the outside, you know, going on with, with this uh, this butter knife squad, you know what I'm saying, over here on, on – uh, Black News 102 on Sidenetta TV, you know, man, these guys have been talking about, oh, it wasn't no Israelites in West Africa. Now, since I went on their show and talked to them, they, oh, they was there. But, you know, how you going to prove they you and all this other stuff when it's like, hey, the point is they're there. So if they're there, there's a strong chance they got caught up in the transatlantic slave trade. So then they want to attack like, oh. You know, uh, 70 A.D., 70 A.D., 70 A.D., bro. 70 A.D. ain't the first time Israelites went into the interior of Africa. That's absurd. You know what I'm saying? Like you have uh, Carthage, you know what I'm saying, that was set up by Israelites. You know, that's on North Africa. You think they didn't veer into the interiors of Africa? Come on, man. Like, let's just be real. And then they want to sit here and say that this eerie amongst the Igbo, which that term, which we're going to find out a little bit later, shouldn't even be utilized because you got different peoples from different parts of the world that just were force amalgamated amongst one another, you know, by the uh, colonialists, by the British colonialists. So they didn't even call themselves Igbo. These people didn't always stay together. They were stayed in different areas. They were different peoples. They just spoke a similar language. So they was forced together. So, I mean, like they act as if, you know, there's just no chance that Israelites ever went into this area. Like there's no archeological evidence, there's no historical evidence, and we're just making it up to make it fit our storyline because we ain't got nowhere to go, you know? But what I'm gonna do in this video mainly, you know, some things gonna deal with after 70 AD, but mainly I'm just gonna deal with before 70 AD all together. I'm gonna deal in the BC periods and uh, the migrations of people going in and out of West Africa when it deals with Israelites, you know, and we're going to see, let the evidence speak for itself. That's always been my thing. You know, uh, people can get out here, talk, 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 but let's just put the evidence out here on the table and let's see what that say. Because you got people out here who are just doing biased scholarship. Like it's completely biased. Like even if you can present something that they can't refute through scholastic means, what they'll then do is try to attack whoever the person is who presented the evidence like and I'm, it's like they acting like this stuff ain't peer reviewed or something you know like other scholars ain't already looked over this and said yeah this look good and it's checked off so you know that's why it's important that we as israelites we just you know get all of our scholarship together and go ahead and be ready just to present this to the people because they need it you know they are members of our community who are mainly bandwagoners that's true and a lot of them, they knew to it. They may be true to it, but they knew to it. And they ain't really just learned everything they need to learn yet. You know, a lot of them need to go to the drawing boards, but, you know, you get stuck into it. You know, it is an emotional thing on both sides of the table. But when your emotions make you completely biased, you can no longer call yourself a scholar. You know what I'm saying? Like they're making uh, being biased against the Bible its own religion. You know, like the, anything that okays the Bible to an extent, they don't like it. Or you have it where they formulate these arguments, like this last one where he killing himself on this Aluda Equiano, and uh, shout out to Bre Brother Reggie, shout out to Sinetta TV too, because he didn't have to let it go down like that, and he did. So I got to give it to him on that, because they called him out on that. That's just being biased because they don't. he doesn't want anything that relates any Israelites being in West Africa. But then, you know, I go on their show, I talk to them for a little while, give them a couple of sources. Now they're saying, yeah, they was in West Africa, you know, but they didn't have a, a, a Bible or a book or something to go by. That's not the argument. I, I don't care if it was all oral tradition to them. They were there. That's the point that we're trying to make. But again, it's one thing to talk. It's another thing to go ahead and go to the evidence. But one more thing I got to say before we, I really go into it is you know what i'm saying i want to give a shout out to uh chief priest daniela 
you know what I'm saying, for also ignoring this cat. You know what I'm saying? Because I know he was trying to get him, trying to get them to call. They was trying to call him out, but he he trying to keep it scholastic with him. You know, how about this? Let's just show our sources. That way we can look over each other's sources and we make sure it's the truth coming out. It's not something that's just geared to win an argument, which is something that we see. And that's the true biasness of everything. It's just they want to win an argument. You know what I'm saying? Give another shout out to uh, Cap. You know what I'm saying? Cap Yacht. You know what I'm saying? Because he gave me a shout out too. Told Garfield if he wanted to debate somebody, he should have debated me because we all know he's been running. But uh, yeah, shout out to him too because he tell it like it is, man. Yo, nobody. You know what I'm saying? At the end of the day, nobody. Because only a nobody comes at scholarship that way. You know what I'm saying? They want attention so bad that they'll come with minimalist arguments. They'll omit tons of information to act like it don't even exist. But anyway, let's just get to it, man. I'm tired of even talking about these cats. Let's get to the scholarship. Let me share my screen real quick. Hold on. Let me make sure it's sharing right. Yeah, we could. All right, man. Here we go right here. Here's the presentation. Israelites in Nigeria. That's the question. At the end of the day, were they in Nigeria? So let's go ahead and let's go ahead and go through this slide real quick, man. Because it's crazy that people will sit here and act like they know all of history after studying for like three or four months. Like, I mean, we had this one cat, man, this dude, Rob Bourne. I don't know what's wrong with him. Anyway, this dude talking about he's been studying Nigeria for the last three to six months. So you think you can study all of Nigeria and all of West Africa in three to six months with all this information that's coming out now? information covered up by colonialists because they didn't want people to know how civilized West Africa really was when they got there. Come on, man. It's the same thing that happened here with the Native Americans. They didn't want people to know how civilized they were. But in the end, truth got to come out. You only can hide it for so long. Anyway, here go the table of contents about what I'm going to be talking about today. The history of the peoples of Nigeria and their oral traditions and archeological evidence of the peoples of Nigeria and their correlations to the oral traditions of the peoples of Nigeria. And that's actually another part of the presentation. I don't know if I'm gonna get to it right now in this video, but if I don't, I'll go ahead and get to part two of it in another video. But let's go ahead and go forward because if anything that we gonna do, we have to, if we gonna say this oral tradition is true, and that we're going to go based on it. We have to find archaeology and correlate it to the oral traditions. We have to know what these oral traditions are in order to correlate it with the archaeology. So this first video is going to be a lot of writing in this one. You know, not as many pictures, not as many things like that, because it's important that we get the background on these things so we can get a good understanding of what we're going to go into when we really start getting into this archaeology. So all right, here you go, uh, history of the peoples of Nigeria. Right here, it says the Hausa linguistic groups, the Yoruba linguistic groups, and the Igbo linguistic groups. Although the history of modern Nigeria can be effectively dated to 1914, when Lord Lugard, the first colonial head of Nigeria, amalgamated Lagos and Southern Pretoriate with Northern Pretoriate, the formation period of the amalgamation is as equally important as the amalgamation itself. Prior to Lugard's administration and the year 1914, the different ethno-linguistic groups that make up contemporary Nigeria were independently of one another, lived independently of one another. In addition, they did not call themselves the different names Hausa, Yoruba, Igbo, etc. So it's clear what happened was they took people of like linguistic groups and they just amalgamated them. Moving forward, history of modern Nigeria. Taking Yoruba as an example, the people existed not as Yoruba people, but as Oyo, Ijebu, Ife, and other names. Similar situation existed in northern Nigeria 
with Kano, Katsina, Zazu, and other groups. And in Eastern Nigeria, where the peoples were referred to as Awak, Anitsha, Afikpo, and other names. There are no Yoruba, no Hausa, no Fulani, no Igbo, no Niger Delta. Nevertheless, it must be asserted that these generic names relate to languages rather than ethnic compositions. So again, we can't sit here and act like all Igbo people are the same people. Like their, their oral traditions have not been intertwined and intermingled with one another. Like we can't act like this. And this right here is from uh, Nigeria by Toyin Falola, PhD, Bakola, Adeyeme, Oye, Niyi, pages 41 and 42. Going forward, and this is on uh, Origins of the People of Nigeria, page 26, same book. For the most part, these stories appear in two forms. On the one hand, these stories deal with the origins of different people from, from time when the world was created. These types of stories set the origin of the human race itself within the context of these different groups. On the other hand, these stories allude to migration by groups from one or more parts of the world to either their former or present location. So here we go again. They're telling you that there's two forms of uh, traditions here. We have an indigenous tradition that says they go back as far as they can remember. And then we have one of migration. And it's important we keep this in mind because what we're being presented on the other side of the table is only an indigenous perspective. And this right here is uh this right here is the book right here, Africa in Focus, Nigeria. And uh Toyin Falola is a PhD, uh, one of the authors of the book. And uh he is the Jacob and Francis Sanger Messicker Chair Professor in Humanities and a distinguished teaching professor at the University of Texas at Austin, down here in Texas. Falola earned his BA and PhD in history at the University of Ife, Ile Ife, in Nigeria. He is a fellow of the Historical Society of Nigeria and of the, and of the Nigerian Academy of Letters. Falola is author and editor of more than 100 books and he is the general editor of the Cambria African Studies series, Cambria Press, a peer reviewed publication. So you can't sit here and try to ride this brother off and here he is right here. So I, I pray that we don't have to deal with this same group of people sitting back trying to ride right off African scholars, people from the continent. And this right here page just, just gives a lot more of his credentials, man. Uh, this guy here, you know, he specializes in Nigeria. It says uh, down here at the bottom, for his singular and distinguished contribution to the study of Africa, his students and colleagues have presented him with the three festive, I don't know how to say that word, to, to edit the Odi Boyo Oye Bade, the transformation of Nigeria essays in honor of Toyin Falola. And the Foundation of Nigeria essays in honor of Toyin Falola, and one editor, one edited by Akin Agun Diran, pre-colonial Nigeria essays in honor of Toyin Falola. His award-winning memoir, a a mouth sweeter than salt, is published by the University of Michigan Press. So come on, this dude here is coming with A1 credentials. So we don't need. Brothers trying to call his brother into question as if he would just lie to further some agenda that doesn't have to do with, you know, the uh, the promotion of Nigeria for what it truly is, a place of great historic relevance for all peoples. OK, now uh, back to the book and we're going to deal with the house of people because they also in Nigeria, you know, and we got to deal with the ethnic groups in Nigeria or the lingua groups that are in Nigeria. So this right here is on page 34 and 35, and it says the Hausa people of Nigeria 
and Niger Republic commonly regard the legendary character Bayida as founder of the house estate. Different traditions that Bayida is the son of the King Abdullah and was a prince in Baghdad, capital of Iraq, when Queen Yadam, also called Zigawa, conquered Baghdad. Bayida fled Baghdad in Iraq with a large number of followers. They traveled through the Sahara Desert and arrived at Kanem Barno, an already well-developed monarchical state. So as we can see, we have uh, someone from the Near East coming in to Kanem Barno, and this is by Lake Chad, for those that don't know, and it was already a monarchical state. So no one is saying that they brought anything, you know, extensively new into this area, like they set up government and then they already had people there to have a monarchical state, all right? In much the same way, Odudua Odu tradition amongst the Yoruba varies. Bayadida traditions also are also many and varied amongst different house estates in Northern Nigeria. So we see that different peoples clearly have different ways of retelling this tradition. And it's likely, because me, I don't call people liars. I take their word for it unless I find evidence otherwise. I would say it would come from the different perspectives of this event taking place. But let's get back to it. Various versions hold in common the fact that Baida came from Baghdad to the western region of Lake Chad. In other versions, his origins is just somewhere in the Near East. So since we have different versions of it, let's just go with the version that is from somewhere in the Near East. So once arrived in Barno, many traditions claim he received, he was well received. A few claim that the reception was not a positive one. One account, not that people of Kanem Barno feared. One account, not that the people of Barnem Karno feared by Yadia because of his large numbers of men. And in another version, he planned to overthrow the Barno king. So now we got one version saying that the people were scared he was coming because he had so many people. I mean, people weren't scared of him, even though he had so many people. But in another version, as if they were scared, he was planning to overthrow the kingdom. And this account in particular, the Barno king received word of this plan and consulted his chiefs, ended up marrying his daughter, Megarum, or Magira, to Baida, then plots to kill Baida, so he, his wife, and one servant fled. His wife gave birth to his first son in Garan Gabas, named Barim, who would be father of the small eponymous kingdom of Gabas at Barnim, uh, Baram, Baram, excuse me. Soon they left for Dora, stopping briefly in Gaia near Kano, where a local blacksmith, which means they already had blacksmiths in the region when this man came, made him a sword. Bayida finally arrived at Dora, the modern day Cassina state. So right here we have this journey that's going on with this man who comes from the Near East, comes to an area, he meets he uh, meets a kingdom, a monarch that's already there. He comes there with a lot of men. They're worried that he's going to overthrow the state in one perspective, but in another one he's well received in another. So the king decides, no matter which perspective you take, the king decides to make peace with him and offer his daughter. But then the king decides he wants to go and kill the man. So him. His, the king's daughter and one of their servants, they flee. So uh, and then there's a long story that goes on, but to make a long story short, we're starting here at the top. Uh, he gets to this area. He, he's so thirsty that he wants water and he asks an old woman and she tells him that a large snake called Sharkin that has plagued the people and prevented them from getting water. So he goes and he brings the, uh, the head of the uh, snake to the old woman and she presents it to the queen. Now, because he, he did this great and his heroic deed, you know what I'm saying? The queen, Magar Jira, Doromna, the queen and ruler of Dora, offered B Baida half the kingdom. However, he refused it for a hand in marriage. 
and and um according to the Dora tradition, however, it forbade her to be have intercourse or it forbade her uh it forbade her from getting married, one or the other. Then uh the queen gave her slave Bagwaria as a wife. Some versions say a concubine. They uh they named the first son Kabagari, which is in the house of language means he snatched the town. Fearing that Bayida would would one day take her country, she may, then married him herself, you know, and then they had a kid and they named him Bawo, which means give it back. These oral traditions relate that Bayadia bore three sons by three women, Bawo, uh, Bawo, son of the queen, had six sons, Dora, Gobir, Kano, Katsina, Rano, Zaria, also called Zazua, Zazao. Together, Bawo and his sons originated the legitimate house estates, the House of Bakwe. Baram, son of Magaram, and Kabagari, son of Bagwara, yeah, raised seven other children who ruled the seven illegitimate states, the bonds of Bakwe. There is no uniform opinion about Bayadida's existence amongst historians. For some, he is a historical figure. For others, he is nothing more than a personification of a migrant group and their efforts to con colonialize and eventually dominate a particular region of present. Now, if we look at this from what the story is telling us, again, we have people who are indigenous as these masters of a mission are presenting it to us as if they're the only ones there, but we have traditions of people migrating from places in the Near East and coming into Western Africa and setting up kingdoms. And even if you don't ex accept that this is a historical person, all scholars would, uh, that don't accept them as a historical person accept them as a migrant group or a group of people, which we often find in, in um, ancient traditions that uh, kings and stuff actually represent the whole body politic of people and not just him himself, which is basic. But let's go forward. History of peoples of Nigeria. Origin of the House of Peoples. And this one right here is uh, actually coming from the book, The Norwegian Nigerian Peoples, Volume 1, printed by Oxford on page 66 by C.K. Uh, Meek. And it says, Kokia, led by a ruler known as Dia or DG, a shortened form of Dia Min Ali Yaman or Dia Ali Min uh, Dia Alaman means he, he that comes from Yemen. According to local tradition, he was a member of one of the Ethiopian Jewish communities. Colonies transplanted from Yemen to Ethiopia, Abyssinia in the sixth century. Now, anyone who knows what's going on in that time, we know is the rise of Islam. Anyone that's practicing any Judaic or Christian tradition would then be kicked out of the region or that they would be exterminated, one or the other. But this is what it's pretty much and uh, it's pretty much talking about. He is said to have moved from moved to West Africa along with his brother. They set up the Jewish community in northern Nigeria, which later merged with the famous seven house estates. And we really going to get into this a bit later when we really get into like what's going on with these house estates, because the seven house estates they're talking about is actually a later addition to an older group. But we'll get to that later. But let's go ahead and move forward. But we see again traditions of people from the Near East moving into West Africa. So in this one, we're going to get into the origins of the Yoruba peoples. And this is on page 26 through uh, 31. And it says, fine quality work abound in the history of Yoruba. Ile Ife, which is what that should say, is largely regarded as the origin, source, and cradle of the Yoruba people. So we know it goes back to Ile Ife when we're talking about the Yoruba peoples. In fact, Yoruba history or the history of any town in Yoruba land cannot be written without situating it within the larger history of Ile Ife. 
It is indisputably recognized as the oldest dynastic state found by Yoruba people. Now, let's remember again, the Yoruba people are not just one people. They are different people from different areas of the world who have amalgamated and speak a similar language. But going forward, Sabaru Bayo Baku suggests that Ile Ife might have been founded between 700 and 1100 AD. So clearly this isn't the oldest people in this, in this land that we call Yoruba land. Yoruba land it goes back thousands of years, as they would tell you. But again, this is a dynastic state that we're talking about. A group of people. And we're gonna and as we find, we're gonna find out they have some near eastern ancestry amongst them. But uh going forward, MD Jeffries, an archaeologist, believes the city must have flourished as an urban center by the 11th century AD. Among Yoruba peoples of southwestern Nigeria region of Nigeria, two distinct stories are told about their origins. One account claims that God called Oludumare in Yoruba language actually created humans in heaven and commissioned them to go and establish and populate the world. Different variants of the account exist. In one variant, Oludumare made the heavens and humans and other celestial beings as well as the earth. Oludumari commanded a band of celestial beings, humans, and divinities to descend from heaven on a spider web and go down to the earth and populate it as the story tells. The more historical account, Sultan Bello of Sokoto, which is the house of Fulani's uh, Sultanate, claims the Yoruba spring from Odudua, a son of La Muduru, La Murudu, one of the kings of Mecca. In the account, the Yoruba people have either migrated from Mecca or somewhere in the Arabian Peninsula as a result of religious persecution. The people relapsed into idolatry, were expelled from Mecca. Now, let's just go over what idolatry would be during this time period in that area where we're talking about Mecca. Idolatry in that area would either be Christianity, Judaism, or one of the old world religions of the Arabian Peninsula, which at that point in time really didn't exist no more. And they would have a hard time proving that one. But we know definitely Judaism, Christianity, and Islam are the pre prevalent cultures or religious traditions during this time period. But let's keep it going. The people relapsed into idolatry and were expelled from Mecca. At the head of a team was Odudua, the son of Lomoruda, Murudu, who led the people, who led the people fleeing Mecca. After 90-day journey, they reached Ile Ife and settled there. Now let's look at this. At Ile Ife, Odududua and his group met 13 octagonist groups, which means they were already there when he got there. The groups fought a prolonged battle that lasted 30 years. So again, we have people coming from the Near East, coming into an area looking to colonialize or dominate the area. This is what we're getting. The, and this battle lasts 30 years. Unable to conquer these 13 octagonist groups, Odudua, and his people were eventually accepted and incorporated into Ile Ife. It was believed that Odudua, due to statesmanship and advanced military prowess, emerged as first among equals. Their willingness to compromise, excuse me, could also, excuse me again, their willingness to compromise could also be use of weapons, military strategy, and statecraft, because anyone knows with all the wars that are constantly going on in the Near East, their weaponry was far more advanced than what we find in uh, West Africa, if we're talking about before maybe uh, 300, 400 BCE. You know, Near East had already had iron and everything like that going on, using them in weaponry and in different 
forms in day-to-day -day life already by this period. But uh, just to uh, keep it moving on, and it says an abundance of evidence exists in Europe or oral traditions that the Aborigines fought the aggressors for more than for about two generations until the time of Morimi, undoubtedly the most famous of the palace queens. According to Ife tradition, the 13 kingdoms and states that were in existence at Ile Ife before Odudua and the autonomous Igbo groups. So here we see that we already had indigenous people there before Odudua came. And this is part of their traditional culture. People coming into the Near East looking to, you know, dominate and colonialize the area. So let's keep it going. In Ife history, there are extremely rich number of reenactment ceremonies and practices commemorating these two different accounts. These enactments occur either annually or at irregular intervals. While some of these ceremonies and practices celebrate the very early periods of Ife history, especially those before Odudua, others celebrate events during Odudua's emergence and immediately after him. Ade Abayeme, in his study of ancient Ife, argues that Ile Ife began as a mini state comprising of several distinct settlements. It transformed into a mega state during the revolutionary phase under Odudua, who settled and organized these 13 pockets of settlements into one unit. Thus, the general belief that Ife history and the entire history of Europe, the world created, started with the coming of Odudua needs some clarification because it is important we clarify this because it goes back further than the time period we were getting from it around 700 AD. What can be safely attributed to Odudua within, without, within an iota of doubt is that he inaugurated a new dynasty and a new political culture. He placed all the components and contiguous communities under his direct rule and they effectively became one unit under Odudua. So now we see someone coming from the Near East, coming into this area and not being able to conquer them through warfare. He conquers them through statesmanship. And because of his, his warfare skills and his different skills with politics and governance, he naturally became a first amongst equals and came to that level of dominance in the area. And he organized them into a dynasty. So we can't act like this history don't exist. But again, this right here is a lot of dealing with the AD period. We haven't even gotten to the BC period, which we'll use to uh, substantiate archaeologically. But uh, here goes some just, you know, some some historical facts that's put out about the Yoruba peoples. Yari is said to connect to Yoruba, Jews of the medieval dispersal. Against, they say dispersal, a medieval dispersal of Jews in the Western Sudan. And this is in Sultan Bellows Chronicle, uh, which was uh, published by, uh, which was recorded by Denham and Clapperton is in volume two, pages 401 through 414. And this is also uh, the writings of Sultan Muhammad Bello and his uh, contribution to scholarship in the Bildad El Sudan, MTM Migna, University of Medu Guri, Nigeria, um, in 1991. And this uh, compilation of uh, Sultan Bellow's work is also taught at uh, Stanford University. So we can't act like this is just some minimalist argument that's being presented. I'm I'm presenting you with, with sources that check out, you know, uh, peer, peer reviewed sources, you know, sources that have been utilized throughout history, you know, and I'm not, I'm not going to do like a lot of these people we see do coming with these uh, minimalist arguments that most people don't even support. And that a lot of times these people later come back and recant on what they put out. But, you know, people aren't thorough with their research, so they just find what they like and hurry up and rush to put it out. But uh, yeah, uh, histories of the people of Nigeria. Now we're getting to the origin of the Igbo's peoples, which is page found on page 32 and 33. And it says, like the Yoruba people, the Igbo peoples have two different accounts of their origin. 
the first mythological claiming that the Igbo people descended from the heavens. The second is a historic is the second is a history of migration from one place to the present locations. Dealing with the latter, migrating from one place to the present locations, the Neri, Aguliri, Umuliri tradition, tradition stones claim that God, Chukwu, created people, created peoples known as Igbo. Elizabeth Ishichi has noted that Neri, Uguliri, Umuliri, and a cluster of other Igbo peoples in and around modern Anambras trace their origin to Erie. Sent by Chukwu, Erie landed on, on the infernal waters in the middle of the Anambra River Valley. He married two women who bore him six children together. This account and its variants do not mention anything of the origin of Erie's wife. So we don't even know where his wives come from. So we don't know yeah. So, I mean, people can't sit here and act as if, you know, uh, what is being presented is just being presented as, you know, solid factual history and is not collect connected to uh, historical traditions, which, you know, uh, when you're dealing with, you know, nations and states, they need some way to connect themselves to uh, something divine. And uh, this eerie person obviously worship uh, Chupu, which is a god. And uh, he is being sent to this area. It doesn't actually mean so as far to say as if he was actually put there. But I mean, that that argument can be presented also. And that's why it's important you present both sides of the argument and then make it clear where, where you lie on this. So uh, again, he uh, we don't know the origin of Eri's wives at all. Uh, Ine Amuku, the first wife, had five children. Aboli and the second wife had five children and Aboli, which is a daughter. And a uh, second wife had one male child. The children of Erie founded several places. Ogulu, the eldest found eldest founder of Gulu Erie, Umu, Neri, which is the kingdom of Neri, Neri Unugu, uh, founded in Igbarium, Agbu. Agbo Dulu, Amenuke, and Iguet, his only daughter, bore children who later founded Iteje and other places. Abu Nike, uh, yeah, and a lot of other places. And it's important, you know, to point out that they're tracing themselves back to this person, Iri, and also that the eldest son, Uguliri. That's also very, very important to point him out. But let's keep it moving. The Neri kingdom, which stretches from Insuka to, to Aqua, Aka, the Orlu in northern central Igbo land, is believed to have been founded at about 900 AD. As Neri and his descendants journeyed from Neri Aqua area to the different places where they are found today. Many of them stay at different spots along the way in the current settlement, along the way to the current settlement, which would explain why you don't have these clusters of, of these people who speak the Igbo languages, why they would be spread out like that because they just set up spots along the way because that's a way of keeping connected to your ancient tradition. That's also a way of trading amongst each other and setting up colonies. That's how you grow out. So, but uh, anyway, and a few areas, and a few areas include western and northern Igbo land and the upper northwest Cross River, including Arrow Confederacy, which are very, very important because we're going to find they also connect to uh, people in the Bible. And it's important and it's not something to be shunning from and something to run away from when you have uh, people who are said to be of a certain son and three of them are found in the histories of a people, you have to take that seriously. You know, uh, so again, uh, including the Arrow Confederacy, oh, oh, Afia, Aka, and Umunoha. In addition to these areas, the Igala people, 
especially those from southern Igala land and part of Benin, are also believed to descend from the Neri kingdom, again, showing that these people were spread out, not in one location, who may have migrated to these areas between the 12th and 15th centuries. In general, Neri Aka areas are undoubtedly the oldest settlement of the Igbo people. So the oldest settlement of an amalgamation of different peoples. Now this one right here is going on to another work, which is uh, the Igbo history of origin by N. Oki and others. They are part of the uh, global, uh, I have to probably get it to you, but I think it's like global research group or something like that out of Nigeria. And uh, is, is, a, is a group of scholars uh, from universities in Nigeria that come together and they're doing their own peer reviewed work. Uh, but again, uh, the Igbo history of origin. And uh, what he did is important because uh, he's going to bring out something that we do need to do. It's important that we do. And it is to not cling to one source or one thing that we find and then try to purport it as this, this one thing defines all things that are going on in that area, or that this one thing means that whole villages or communities of people came to one area. You know, we have to have a more uh, broad uh, way of showing this. Like we need to show it through archeological history. We need to throw it through oral tradition, uh, any written histories that's found in the area. Uh, uh, the anthropology, we need to look at, you know, any new vegetation brought in areas during different time periods. All these things are very, very important when we're trying to find out who are peoples in a group and they got to be brought to the table. Now, he doesn't do all these things, but he tells us not to cling to one thing. But uh, just let's keep it moving. Um, here it says, we are still looking towards our historians to supply us with valid and acceptable answer to the origin of the Igbo people. We are no longer comfortable with guesswork or quoting an Igbo slave, Aluda Equiano, and some out of bar statements by, by some Igbo elders in connection with the origin of the Igbo. That, that Igbo is a migrant group is no longer debatable as no ethnic group over the world can boast of not migrating from somewhere or mixing up with some or other migrant groups from elsewhere. Therefore, no matter how beautifully we might argue that the Igbo do not belong to or, do, or, ha, or have some elements of migrant groups in them may not be seen as historically true. So any argument against migration groups coming into West Africa over the course of history is absurd to most scholars, like to all scholars. I don't know no scholar that says nobody has ever migrated into a certain area from somewhere else. I mean, I mean, in ancient history, everyone migrated. They were hunters and gatherers, according to what y'all believe. So, I mean, like, what would even make you think that? Anyway. Nothing about the Igbo could be more historic than their origin, which over the years has provoked challenges and tussles amongst the historians of Igbo extraction and beyond. According to Isichi in 1976, no historical question arouses more interest among present day Igbo than the inquiry, where do the Igbo come from? There has existed an avalanche of guesswork and suggestions by the Igbo historians and ethnologists concerning the origin of the Igbo people. All that were said about the origin of the Igbo should be summarized only in two headings, the outside motif and the aborigine motif. Something that when uh, one of these butter knife squad brothers did his presentation, he didn't present both sides of the argument at all. He just presented what seemed to be uh, alluding to an aborigine motif and that they had no outside influence, which he seemed to be constantly alluding to. But anyway, uh, let's just go back for a second and look at something. Now, when he says that uh, quoting an Igbo slave, Aluda Equiano, I mean, most people know that that correlates to a, a Jew connection. You know, an Israelite connection, that, that, that's not something to be uh, 
Shonda ran from. And the author is, or the scholar here is definitely not trying to speak ill of Aluda Equiano in any way like some other brothers uh, tried to do and have been brought to task on that. You know what I'm saying? How biased scholarship and uh, disagreements with a group of people have led certain people to try to discount important people to our history. No, he's not trying to do that at all. W what he's trying to do is say that we need more evidence than just that. That's not enough. But uh, anyway, back here to the uh, outside origin and the aboriginal motif. All right. The outside origin, according to Chukwu Ma in 1994, Mr. Innocent Okiri gave a new dimension to the history of the origin of the Igbo people. Okiri is of the view that the Igbo are the Jews who fled from Israel following the persecution of the Israelites by Assyrians. They moved southwards from Hebron and Beersheba and arrived in Cairo in 710 BC. They, the Igbo, soon departed Egypt, which I heard one of the brothers say, well, they have traditions of them coming from Egypt. Yes, they do, because they came through Egypt. That's without question. Uh, they, the Igbo, soon departed Egypt and journeyed to their present habitat where they were joined by other exiles of Jew of the Jewish province of Habatia, called the Ephik Donelis, Donelis, or present-day Ephiks. The Igbo and Ephik arrived first in Nigeria in 638 BC after the exile of the Israelites in 710 BC. Now, this is important that this is presented because this is actually what scholars discuss. This isn't a minimalist argument that the Igbo have origins, as in one of their origins, so origin with an S, with Israelites. This is something that have been discussed for a long time. So let's go ahead and keep it moving. The entire Igbo never migrated into Nigeria one day. And again, this is the outside motif. The Igbo who arrived very early are the Eri group. After Eri, the fifth son of Gad, found in Genesis 46 and 16. Then you had the Arrow group, uh, which is after Arodi and Aureli, which is found in Genesis 46 and 16 as well. This scholar. Alaizi holds that the Igbo in Nigeria are made up of Hebrew exiles from different tribes of Israel and not from a particular tribe or place as Shechen Igbo. He came up with tribal origins of many important Igbo towns. From the tribe of Iri, we have Agulu Iri, Ora Iri, Umulu Iri. Ebi Mbiri, Oiri, Nukwiri. From the tribe of Iri, yeah. From the tribe of Arodi, we have Aro, Aro Chupu, Orodi, Izogu, etc. And it's it's plenty of other ones on this list, man. If you see the list that's going here, this list is the least of about 40 names, it seems like, man. But uh, I got a few that I wanted to point out here. We have uh, we have Ahab, King Ahab. We have a town, Ahaba, uh, in uh, Abia State. And then from the tribe of Levi, um, and this is found in Nehemiah 12 and 20, we have Amok with Amorka, or Amaku, name of towns in Anambra, in Aliyah, Ali, Abia, and the River States. And then for Gad, as we went through early, we have Erie, Arodi, Aureli, and we have Erie, we have the Neri state, the Neri kingdom. And for Arodi and for uh, Aureli, we have the Aero Confederacy or the Orochupu and the Arodi Izugu, Izogu. And then from Zebulon, which we find in Genesis 46 and 14, we have Ozubu, Ozubulu. And then uh, in others, like we have uh, a hero from Naphtali, we find in number seven and 78, we have a hero 
town in Mbazik emo state. So we can see from the long list that he has, and uh, when we look at these scholars, they do include linguists in this group of scholars. So from this uh, group that we have, we see that they have used linguistics to link these states. You know, this, this is part of what the uh, outside motif has in it, you know, and it's important that we look at the information and we analyze the information and not just try to write it off like we see brothers constantly trying to do. It says many Igbo scholars are of the view that the Igbo people are from the Jews. Ogbalu in 1981, Chukuma in 1994, Arienzi in 1974, Oraka in 1983, Iziala in 1992, Ono Nuju in 1996, and Alaizi in 1998, etc., are in the view of the above. These scholars, however, could not agree on the exact places of origin in Israel. Izaala favored Shechenigbo. This view has been contested against so radically by an ethnolinguist who supported his criticism with biblical quotation and dates, which, which is important because just because they all agree that they're connected to Jews does not mean that they can pinpoint which exact Jews they're, they're connected to or any particular group that they're connected to through their studies. Now, uh, Alaizi has some work later on that will help pinpoint one group out of the many, but just like his work here shows by using a different town, he pinpointed many different tribes. You have Levi, Judah, Gad, Zebulon, Naphtali. So you got many different tribes that they're accounting for from this outside motif. And then it says the movement into Nigeria by the exiled Hebrews was as a result of God's curse upon the Israelites for disobeying him. Now, this is important because it gives us time frame here. King Shalomanazar V of Assyria defeated Israel and drove away the inhabitants after rendering the entire land desolate. The next scattering of the, he scattering of the Hebrew with God's plan was by the Babylonians under King Nebuchadnezzar, first in 536 BC and the second in 586. Ali Easy, page 31. The last Gentile power used by God to scatter his people Israel for disobeying him was the Roman Empire. In 70 AD, a time period people love to talk about, the Roman generous, general Titus drove away the remaining two tribes of Israel, ben, Judah and Benjamin, on final fulfillment of God's curse on them, Deuteronomy 28, Ezekiel 23. With this last scattering exercise by the Romans, about 700,000 Hebrews found themselves back in Egypt. From Egypt, they were moved to Tunisia, Northern Africa, Syria, Iraq, Morocco, Northern Africa, Libya, Northern Africa, the Sudan in Africa, and Sub-Saharan Africa, settling in the largest number in Nigeria. This movement took them about 80 years. That is twice the duration of Exodus from Egypt to Canaan. And we know that during this time period, Tacitus, which is a primary source for the time period, talks about the argument that these people are of Ethiopian origin. Now, there is no way that you have an argument during this time period when we know the term atheops itself means burnt face people that they're comparing to jews to burnt face people if they are not a member of burnt face peoples that's just common sense so these were people of color of dark color to be thought to be of ethiopian origin but then to be unbiased, you have the aboriginal motif. And I'm not going to go too deep into it because I think it is good at defining itself with just a little bit that I'll show. And then it says, 
The above proves the claim about the Igbo affinity with Hebrews, notwithstanding many people, including some eminent scholars of Igbo origin, still disapprove the Orientalist view of the origin of the Igbo people. Such people vehemently preach that the history of the Igbo origin should not be sourced from outside Nigeria, but rather they developed independently like other indigenous people, African people. According to P.I. Okwe Sili, Diria 2001, in his essay titled Comparative Study of Priesthood, Israelite, and Igbo Religions, reproduced in soci socio-philosophical perspective of African traditional religion, the Igbo and the, and the Hebrews have no real relationship. He categorically states, socioculturally, there is no relationship between the Israelites and the Igbo. And this is something that I've seen them guys also show. And I mean, like, again, if we're going with the narrative that is pre being presented by the outside motif, this is a punishment that's being rendered on them for not being obedient. So I am not of the mindset that these people who are being punished were in war, fleeing from that war, have now decided, hey, I'm going to act right when they're still being punished and scattered out of the land. I mean, I'm just not, I'm, I'm not going to sit here and make that assertion that, yeah, they, they, they did their punishment, they act right, but they didn't come back to the land because of that. No. I'm under the assumption that they still will be uh, taking in and amalgamating themselves amongst the other heathens that are around them because that's what they did. But uh, to keep it moving, historically speaking, which is important, the Igbo have occupied at least the Insaka, Akigwe, Kusta, and the Aka, Orlu Highlands by the third millennial BC. Israel herself came into existence as a people by the end of the second millennium BC. Before the Senial covenants of Hebrews or Israelites were still semi nomads moving back and forth in, which is pretty much, she's pretty much saying like, look, we have evidence of Igbos being here before Israelites is even a nation. And look, no one should argue with that. That is that's solid because there is solid evidence that people were there before Israelites were even a nation. The archaeological discovery of Professor Thurston Shaw of the Institute of African Studies at the University of Ibdan and that of Professor Hartle of the University of Nigeria in Suka and the research of Professor Onwe Ijeo, an Igbo ethnologist, add to the credibility of the above assertion. Pio Achibe, a Igbo theologian, had in his part argued that there had been a continuous occupation of Igbo land for at least 3,000 years. He made this conclusion after going through the results of the works of Shaw, Hartle, and N.W. Eje Ogwu. Igbo as an ignorant, as a migrant group are believed to be the lost tribe of Israel who either started their migration from Shechen Igbo in Judah under the leadership of Jabo Bor Igbo or from various tribes of Judah. To prove the fact, we realize that virtually all the names of the towns in Igbo land are the corrupt forms of the towns in Israel. Names of Israelites or, or coined using Hebrew words that reflect the mood, circumstance, experience, etc., of the people in the course of their migration. There is also the Niger Benu confluence theory, which says that the Igbo migrated from the confluence to occupy the towns in which they are inhabiting today. We equally have the Aborigine motif which says that the Igbo never migrated from anywhere, but were created and planted in Eastern Nigeria from the dawn of history. Now, again, 
when we go back and we look at it, we know there's no people that can boast of never having people migrate amongst them. So when we look at this Aborigine motif and we look at the outside motif, they both have a lot of evidence to support them. Put forth by two different groups of scholars. So we can't sit here and act like we're going we gonna to just discount it. But the thing that people aren't doing is saying, OK, can they both be true? And yes, they both can absolutely be true. You can have an outside motif while you have an origine, aborigine motif. You can have people who have always dwelt there since as far back as they can remember. And you can have people who have recently migrated or in, in their ancestry migrated there from somewhere in the Near East, as we see many traditions in Nigeria talk about. But OK, so since we've dealt with the fact that we have an aborigine motif, which means they've always been there. And then we have the outside motif and that it is very possible for both of them to exist. It's time to dig into Erie because this is where I've seen the brother make a presentation and make it as if there's no connection whatsoever between Hebrews and the Neary kingdom. But we're going to see right here in this presentation, is that true? And again, I'm using peer reviewed sources and I'm using scholars in Africa, not, not any scholars from somewhere else talking about what they read. I'm using the scholars in Africa that's going to deal with the spirituality of the Neary Kingdom and the history of the Neary Kingdom. All right. So in this one, we have the Obu Gad, the sacred temple of mortality and brotherhood in the Aguliri Kingdom. Now, again, we got to remember. Oguliri is the oldest son of Erie. All right. So we got to keep that in perspective. And we know that in patriarchal traditions, that things, unless that eldest son did something horrible, that things normally go to the eldest son in traditions. But let's go. Uh, this was right here was uh, published in the International Journal, Journal of Modern Education Research, volume three, number six, on pages 52 through, through uh, 59. And then I have the website there for anybody who wants to see it. It was submitted for peer review, viewed and received on October the 7th, 2016. It was accepted on October the 18th in 2016. And it was published on January 12th, 2017. So this is new. This ain't nothing that you can sit here and claim is outdated. Like a lot of the scholarship that some of these brothers be bringing forth do be. The American America Association for Science and Technology also did a, 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 um, a article on this as well. And uh, the scholar here is, is Madukasi Frox Chokes, Department of Religion and Society, Chuku Imeka, Odume Guru, Ojukuwu, University Igbarium Campus, Nigeria. Then you have Settler Gulanio Federico, College of Humanities, History of Religion, Philosophy and Classics, University of KwaZulu Natal, P. P. Martinburg, South Africa, Okiki Nikiru Joy, Department of Linguistics, Igbo, and of the same University of Igbarium campus. So let's keep it moving. Yeah. So this is what it had to say. In every empire kingdom, there is a tradi traditional mystical force that wields every community together be it Europe, America, Asia, or Africa, and or Africa. In Igbo tradition, coronation of king is viewed as a kingly festival, especially when it comes to kingship in Erie Kingdom. In the coronation of any new king within Erie Kingdom, especially the Neri King, which takes place at Obugad alongside the Oduduizi, the covenant pot clay, the coronation will not take place uh, without the Odudu easy, the, the uh, covenant pot play, clay, the coronation will not take place. The, the, if, hold on one second, folks. Got a phone call real quick. I gotta click that up and get it out the way. All right, let me get it back up. 
All right. All right, let's get back to where we was. All right. The Erie Kingdom, especially the Neri Kingdom, which takes place at Obogad alongside with the Odudu Easy, the Covenant Pot Clay, the coronation will not take place. The excavating of this covenant, covenant pot clay is the deepest depth of the confluence of the two rivers, Izuna Omenbala, which is actually what they call the land, Omenbala. But the Izuna Omenbala is highly surrounded with mis mysteries up till today. This paper examines this Obel God be becomes an indigenous sacred temple of mortality that binds the Igbo communities in ritual symbology of brotherhood and services as an epicenter of global tourism. In African traditional religion, sacred places are special and ordained places designated to the divine. The pl a place like Obu God and Obu Liri cosmology symbolizes a special place for the union of time and space within the incarnation evolution of timeless energy, which in turn, it is of two folds, which represent the physical and the spiritual. Now this is very important in I think all spiritual systems, uh, the, you need the physical and the spiritual. The problem that we have a lot of times is brothers want to get either too physical with it or they want to get too spiritual with it. When where we're supposed to be is in the middle, the unity between heaven and earth, and that is throughout Torah. But let's keep it moving. The traditional Igbo paradigm, Obugad, as a sacred institution, has become a symbol of place at which the living and the spiritual can basically meet and unite, especially as it has to do with the institution of kingship. Primarily, Obu God, from time immemorial, is believed to be a sacred shrine that represents a separate sacred realm that connects the Igbo to their to their great ancestor Iri. Excuse me, and reunite and reconfirm their brother brotherly relationship and keep it for posterity through time to both time and space such sacred space therefore becomes an epicenter of religious communication where the sacred is experienced and worshiped through the sacred ordination of ritual coronation of indigenous igbo kings that repositions aguliri as the head of the igbo diaspora so what we see is this eldest son aguliri that all the kings that are connected to Erie have to come to him to get coronation. And this is very, very important when we talk about the patriarchy and the understanding and importance of the patriarchy, which we have a lot of brothers who try to act like don't exist when Western Africa is a patriarchal society through and through. I mean, yeah, you may find maybe a little tribe here and there that may have some matriarchy by descending through the matrilineal lineage, but that isn't a true patriarchy, just like Egypt wasn't a true patriarchy. But anyway, a brief history of Aguliri religion. According to, it is possible to visit Aguliri and go away seeing almost nothing of the town at all. Most of the houses are set back from the road and cover a wide area in the classic Igbo pattern. And one may know the town well and never guess the immense antiquity, for there is nothing visible to suggest it. Now, this is crazy because, you know, a lot of these brothers come out and they be like, oh, what you got to show? What you got to show? Show me this, show me that, show me that, uh, show me this archaeology. Show me. They sitting here telling you right now, according to their tradition that they have, it ain't much they would have to show you to show that this is some great and grand place and this, this grand epicenter. It just exists as part of tradition, as part of culture. That is more important than any physical thing or stone or rock that's carved that you can put forth, tradition and culture. But yet Aguliri, perhaps more than any other place, was the cradle of Igbo civilization. As lo a long history 
encapsulates in, encapsulated in mythology, we call a man called Eerie sent from God who lived there. But dressing, but dressing this affirms the sacred temple in which it figure in which it figures lies in Aguliri, a farming, fishing Igbo community on um, Omambala River Basin of Southeast Nigeria. According to Oguliri is a very large town situated at the bank of the Anambra or an Anambra called Amambala by the indigenes and corruptly nicknamed Anambra by the European settlers. So Amambala is what we need to call it. Despite being a largely nautical people who regularly traveled down river to trade, Aguliri people are basically farmers. Their traditional way of, of life was so good and satisfactory that in recent times they have often been reluctant to abandon the land and move into modern sector of the Nigerian economy, although Aguliri people are part of the larger Igbo till date. So this is showing you that even their ancient traditions and ways they were living are enough to suffice them to this very time period, showing that it is not a prerequisite for advancement that we adopt the ways of the colonialists, but there can be a great silver lining there where we go back to our ancient ways, traditions, and customs but we can still have a merchant class. Like they say, they had traders that travel up and down the river trading. We still have a merchant class that interacts with other peoples and brings the things that we can't make there in our community into our community and sell the things that we do make in our community to another community. That's true economics. People talking about they have economic plans, but it's not true economics. What they're doing is they're trying to put out a get quick rich scheme or trying to make your debt slaves, where you sit there and you take out all this debt, but shoot, you gotta repay it. Who's to say people are gonna come? Who's to say this is a surefire plan? I mean, a lot of these people, they don't deal with higher powers. What do you believe in to make this happen? A person? Well, I mean, my my spirituality treats me teaches me to put my trust in no man whatsoever. So I stand on that. Anything I want to build, I want to be able to build and sustain myself. I don't have to have anybody else come and join with me. Now, if they want to join with me, come on, brother, let's make this money together. You know what I'm saying? Let's make this build our own economy together, our own brotherhood together. But it's not necessary for me to put myself in, 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 in debt slavery to another people. Just to advance. When if it all collapses, now I'm in debt for the rest of my life. My credit's messed up for the rest of my life and I got nothing to show for. it. And this is a lot of what goes on in the community. And it's, I don't think that brothers have the intention of scamming people whatsoever. I think they are true in their intent, but I don't think they think things through to their logical conclusions. I don't think they look back into past history when if things like this take place. There's normally not a huge group of people that come together and do it. It is a small group of people that come together and do it. And that is what is taught throughout history. As far back in time as you go, small groups of people. But again, let's get back to the subject. I don't wanna go off on talking about other things. But yeah, so it's important to remember that they're trading here and that Erie is the center of the Igbo civilization. It is the cradle in Aguliri, is the cradle of Igbo civilization, and his father was Eri, who passed down the kingship or authority to him. So uh, again, we have the origins and the migrations, and uh, we'll read some of this. I don't think we have to read all of this. Uh, the origin and migration. The origin of Aguliri people would be linked to the migration of the Igbo race to this present to this present Nigeria as a nation who are among the Hebrew patriarchs from Mesopotamia to their new homeland in Palestine. Commenting on the history of the Israelites again argues that it is true that the position taken above, which is one that is widely held today, has been vigorously 
contested in recent years by certain scholars who maintain that the patriarchal narratives are more or less imaginative literary cre creations of a much later date, the early, the early monarchy or even the exilic period with no appreciable stream of oral tradition behind them and without real historiographical intention or historical worth. Erie and his entourage continue their migration southward until they finally settled at a place known to us today as Uguliri, the ancestral home of the Igbo around 1303 BC at the confluence of two rivers, Izu and Omanbala, a tributary of the great Niger River. Now, as we see, he's putting in this uh, uh, migration that they're showing here with the migration pattern, they're putting it as early as 1303 BCE. Now, to be fair, I will say there is no concrete archaeological evidence or changes that I can show going back to 1303 BCE that without a doubt would show this. But if what he's saying is true and they're saying, hey, that it's 3,000 years of continuous occupation has been here and it's before we are really, really a nation. And I take it that they're saying, you know, a nation as in a unified body politic under, under the Dawid, then uh, 1303 BC, yeah, we, we were not a nation at that time whatsoever, but it does not rule it out as a possibility. And uh, when we get to the archaeology again, we're going to explore that, but that won't really be explored in depth because, again, like I said, there's not much that I can present there. Uh, except uh, later on, much later on, when I start dealing with, you know, the agriculture and stuff in that area and the Phoenician uh, expand. I mean, not the Phoenician, but the Ubuntu expansion, which does deal with the Phoenicians, which is very important to keep them connected to that. But, uh, yeah, the Obu Gad, this is Gas Memorial Palace. And they're clearly saying that this is Gad Memorial Palace it is apparently visible. And this remains an epicenter for global tourism site in Aguliri town of Anambra state or Amambala state till date. Commenting on the significance of this sacred place argues that this place is very paramount because it was at this point that Erie had a divine revelation that they had reached their ordained place of settlement. So if he's having a divine you know, revelation that they that means they came from somewhere. So the migration is still standing here with Erie. Sentiment. It is on this position that affirms that historically it is from the point that each settlement pursued its own separate existence and development owing allegiance to Aguliri, where the collective ancestral temple of Erie still stands to this day. To ascertain the authenticity and significance of this site to the tradition, culture, and hegemony of the Igbo people echoes that this is why before any Neri tradition ruler is installed, the king is led to Aguliri, where he performs sacrifices to the sacred temple of Abu Ghab before being given the scepter of authority or Odudu Easy by the Igwe of Aguliri. Because remember, Aguliri is the oldest son of Eri. So by tradition, he would then bestow authority upon his, bestow his father's authority upon his other brothers. And it says this, this depicted that Aguliri people have a strong belief in the existence of one God, the creator of all things whom they call Chuk, Chuku, the supreme being. And ancestor worship is also practiced where the people offer sacrifices to their dead fathers or pour out a little liquor. <laughs> In Aguliri tradition, the king is believed to serve as an earthly representative between God and the people. He's an intercessor. And this demonstrated convincingly that the concept of God was indigenous to the Igbo religious tradition, which promises concrete blessings and protection. So the Neri kingdom, this is pre-colonial. You know, their tradition is pre-colonial. It wasn't that highly influenced by Islam, they mostly held on to their traditions. So this would be reflecting pre-colonial, pre-Islamic 
conquest Western Africa. And what we're finding is we do find traditions that are connected to this Erie, it's connected to Gad. We've also found it connected to other sons of Gad, which we got Olu, uh, um, Ala Erie and Orodi. We have those two as well. So, I mean, this, this is in their tradition. This is being discussed among scholars. This is not something that should be omitted by these guys. These guys are masters of omission. And if you do not research yourself, they'll trap you because if you don't understand the chronological order, you don't understand the migration patterns, you don't understand the archaeology that supports your point, where can you really stand in an argument? But they know that don't work with me. But the significance of the sacred temple. As a point of emphasis, it is significant to mention here that the claim of Oguliri as the cradle of Igbo civilization and the head of the Igbo people is by virtue of the being the firstborn of Eri, the father of the Igbos, who had at, at the death of his father was given the scepter of authority to rule Eri set, settlement. Therefore, and again, we know that scepters of authority being passed, I mean, come on, that, that, that's throughout biblical tradition of fathers passing on the scepter, that the scepter will reside in Judah. You know, this is just part of tradition. Fathers pass on scepters of authority to their sons in Near Eastern cultures. But therefore, a centralized authority like Neri had no authority over settlement towns established by his offspring. This sacred object, which stands for authority, justice, and leadership among the Igbo people serve as a binding force amongst the communities that constitutes Erie kingdom to their common successor. So what this is showing is even though the Neri state rose to power, that centralized power always still would be held with Oguliri because no one got authority without the king or high priest of the Oguliri uh, people bestowing that authority upon them. And I don't want to sit there and keep taking you through all these uh, writings, but let me hit a little bit more. Uh, the, these types of shrines serve also among the power points of expressing the believer's sense of sacred of the sacred and the orderness of divine realities it is on this ground that describes such such shrine as primarily the face of the divinity there the divinity is represented by the emblems which are regarded as sufficient reminders of his attributes now, that's important because a lot of people consider like a lot of symbols and stuff. They see forms of idolatry. No, these symbols have meanings behind them. They are attributes of the divine one that they worship. And as we see that they worship the one true God, the creator God, then it, it's clear that these representations are just aspects of who he is, not different, different idols or things of that aspect. On this tradition, pragmatically and symbolically describes such sacred shrine as the place where the heaven comes down to earth. So my real question is for all these atheists who are talking about they, they, they Afrocentric and that they going back to these African traditions and studying these African cultures. How are you atheists when you can't name an atheist African culture? I think my brother um, Mikael Ben Israel, shout out to you big bro, he posed that question to Unk, the so-called God, God killer. How are you a God killer? How are you such a big atheist when you, when it, there is no ancient atheist civilization in West Africa? Can't name it. As much as y'all try to make Kemet uh, atheist, Jabari is an example of how you're lying. And that's just keeping it real. There, there were definitely practitioners who believed that there were essences behind these energies to be worshipped. And uh, we're not going to go through all this, but I think I will just read the top one uh, and the bottom one. But unlike the other sacred places in Oguliri, which are restricted, restrictly used for rituals and other festivals, the sacred place of Obu God is either for social or religious occasions. This is because of the excavation of Oduizi alongside the ritual involved in the coronation of Igbo kings are performed around the tomb of Eri 
the progenitor of the Igbo race and the co-joining three mystical trees that symbolizes the affinity of the three brothers, which comprised, which comprised of Oku Liri, a son of Erie, Neri, a son of Erie, and Arodi from the Aero Confederacy, who both represent Arodi and Arelili, uh, Areli, are part of the Aero Confederacy that is combined with the Neri group. So they are from two different progenitors, but they have combined themselves and subject, well, I wouldn't say subjugated themselves, but joined themselves to the Neri kingdom. But, uh, but uh, again, symbolize the affinity of the three brothers, which comprise of Uguliri, Neri, Arodi, situated at the shrine of Ogul God. No wonder, no wonder echoes that Ogul God is a place of, of spiritual rededication and evocation of proud ancestry of Eri, of Eri descendants and in the Igbo in general. It is a sacred place for royal empowerment and self purification. Now we can get into these other parts with, that goes in talking about how sacred it is, but let's speed this up a little bit and keep it moving. Uh, and so I'm reading the bottom one here. In so far as the sepulchre of authority given to Oguliri by his father Eri, the father of the Igbo race, as a representation of the divine, which has its ritualistic functionalities embedded in it. This marks Oguliri as the repository and custodian of genuine tradition. That means that the tradition that these guys are keeping is not influenced by the outside people. So you can't keep saying that uh, that colonialists came in and influenced it or that they was influenced by I Islam. These scholars who are in Nigeria, from Nigeria, educated in Nigeria, are saying that these are genuine tradition. Nevertheless, in times of oath taking, most Igbo communities will ask the holder of the Ofo to assemble with their Ofo. The suspect, the suspect must swear, and this implies that oaths and Ofo plays vital functions as sanctions. Holders of Ofo are given special respect in the community. This is because it is believed that they are car carrying or holding a symbol of both blessing and cursing. Come on now, you can't act like that ain't a spiritual aspect. Owing to the itinerate nature of his priestly duties, which means he moves around from time to time, you know, he has to go from town to town. Neri was given powers to hand Ofo to community leaders in different Igbo settlements as he traveled far and wide in the course of his duties as the priest and traditional doctor of the Igbo people. This is why before any near traditional ruler is installed, the king is led to Oguliri, where he performs sacrifices to the sacred temple of Obuga before being given the scepter of authority, the Odudu Easy by the Igwe of the Agulu Iri, which is the king of the Agulu or the king and priest of the Agulu Iri, who has been given authority by his father Iri, the son of Gad, to give authority to the different community leaders. Writing on the ritual progress process involves, uh, involves asserts that it is during the ritual coronation journey that the acclaimed Niri king would stay four days at Aguliri in Obugad to receive the blessings of Erie and to collect a lump of clay from the bottom of the Amambala instead of a number of rivers by divers. Also, it is through the mystical journey during the coronation of the Neri king by the Aguliri that, that affirms that there is a divine injunction that the candidate is ordered to go to Uguliri obtain Odudu and may Odudu easy and and may you return safe to your people to rule your people. Commenting on the process of the symbolic ritual festival, again asserts that during such coronations, a spirit a spirit seeker is consulted for the most propitious days 
to raise the Odudu. A sacrifice is made on the river bank. The future divine king points his points his ofu over the water and prays that all dangers be removed. Whereupon a man plunges in and brings up the Odudu. Feasting and rejoicing now follows. The candidate has proved his godhead through the kingship rituals originated, ordinated, affirms that the Neri kingship has a deep and long connection to Ogulu Eri. Lamenting on this argues that the Eri and Ogulu Eri connection is, is avoided by some Igbo scholars, which is a lot of them that are against this uh, migration, in order to give them the opportunity to of projecting Neri as the head of the Igbos, because if you take Neri and project him as the head of the Igbo and take away Oguliri, it doesn't point you back to Eri, who is the son of Gad. And a lot of them, because they just want to get away from the Bible whatsoever, like a lot of these brothers do, they just want to sit back and say, okay, we won't deal with that at all. We're just going to deal with this, you know, being masters of omission. All right. And this right here is where we finish it up yet. We're going to give you the rest of the uh, that and then we're going to give you the conclusion of that of that paper. And it says, insofar as the sepulchre of authority is given to Oguliri by his father, Eri, the father of the Igbo race, is a representation of, of the divine, which is a ritualistic functionalities embedded in it. This argues Oguliri as the repository and custodian of genuine tradition which this is something I already put in there earlier. So let's go ahead and go to the conclusion. The sacred temple of Obugad is an ancient ritual center for keeping and binding the brotherhood of Igbo communities together because Erie is believed to be their great ancestors. In this wise, through the mediation of its symbolism and cultural ethnos, the ancient spiritual center is so regarded that it portrays Aguliri as the spiritual epicenter of the ritual convocation and reunification of other Igbo communities that make up the Igbo race through their ritualistic endeavors. Summarily, it has been observed that Obu God is a place for ritual rededication and evocation of a proud ancestry of eerie descendants and in the Igbo in general. It is a sacred place for royal empowerment self-purification and showcasing global tourism of Amumbala or a number state of Nigeria. Now let's just go ahead and go back real quick. Let's go back. Now let's just really take a look at this. Now we've again, we've shown that they have traditions that show that there have been migrations coming into this area throughout history. We have a connection through the Israelites, one going back to as far as 1303 BCE, which would have mean that uh, the children of Erie, if that's who they're connecting it to, it means that those children of Erie uh, either went into the promised land and decided they didn't want to fight the Canaanites for the land and dipped and went into Africa and amalgamated amongst the people there or found a land and dwelt there. But we also have the arguments that during the Assyrian captivity, that people were pushed out of the land and they went and settled into this, this area in West Africa. We have arguments that during the uh, Babylonian captivity and after that they were, uh, that when they came back to their lands that they would find no place for themselves and go down there. And then we also have a 70 AD argument, which I am not gonna argue, definitely not today. But then even so, we also have later arguments of Odudua. We have arguments of Alayaman. Uh, both of them saying that uh, from the Igbo, not the Igbo, from the Hausa and the Yoruba, saying that these people came from somewhere in the Near East and migrated into this area and uh, amalgamated amongst the people. And this is around 600, 700 AD period. This is way after 70 AD. But uh, again, I'm not going to go into the archaeology in depth of after 70 AD. We're going to chill with everything that's above 70 AD when the archaeology comes. Now, we know that CNN, they did uh, a research on these people. They have put out documentaries about these people, uh, these Igbos who are sitting there saying that they traced their lineage back to Erie, son of Gad, and that there also were other tribes that came and amalgamated amongst them. 
And again, so let's go ahead. Let's see what the actual king of Aguleri has to say about it. Easy A.E. Chukwu Imeka Iri, the king of the community of Aguleri, wears a white shirt with the Star of David stitched on the front. He is building a center for the study of Judaism. And yes, they have indeed went back to, uh, they have indeed, I wouldn't say went back, but they have converted to uh, Orthodox Judaism in order to get relief and help from the Israeli government because they are not prone to helping ethnic groups of Jews anywhere in the world. And there have been many studies also that have been done trying to disprove this connection. But uh, let's go ahead and keep it moving. All right. And in that article, it says, the son of Yaakov, Jacob, was Gad. And I learned that he was among those people who went out of Israel to exile, Arbor says. So from there, he had a son called Erie. And a son, and a son gave birth, and his son gave birth to a son called Agulu Erie. And that's how the Igbo race began. From generation to generation, some Igbo have passed down various versions of the migration history framed through Jacob, a patriarch of Judaism. A popular version of the narrative holds that Gad, the seventh son of Jacob, had three sons who settled in present day eastern Nigeria, which is predominantly inhabited by the Igbo. Those sons, Iri, Orodi, and Ale Aureli, as mentioned in the book of Genesis, which is in uh, chapter 46, verse 16, are said to have fathered clans, established kingdoms, and founded towns still in existence in southeastern Nigeria today, including Owe Iri, Omulu, Omulu Iri, Oro Chupu, and Ogulu Iri. Easy, or the king, of the community of Aguliri claims he presides over the throne of Gad's son Eri. So now, again, these brothers have actually tried to discredit this man, a man who scholars in Igbo land say is the custodian of the true tradition of the people. At Aguliri, he is the king of the community. And, and these brothers have been saying that these brothers have been turned their backs on the Igbo community, that they have accepted Orthodox Judaism, and that they, they that this is something that is new, and they have been influenced by these people, even though the scholars in Nigerian universities say that these are the true custodians of the true traditions of the Erie peoples. Come on, man. And which is just a group of peoples amongst the Igbo, because remember, the Igbo are not all one people from one migration. They're not all from the same lineage. They are different groups. And this is just one group of them. It's just stated, as we've seen earlier, that the largest number of, of, of people of the diaspora of our peoples were, uh, went down into Nigeria. So when what you do when you amalgamate groups is what you do is you take the dominant group and you amalgamate the smaller groups who speak that language, which would have been colonies trailing to other places or other people that came in and spoke a likewise language, is you amalgamate them all together. Some of these people have different traditions. Some of these people have no tradition going back to here. Some of these uh, different traditions have all been interwoven over the course of the last hundred years or so to where the point that they all intertwine in certain area so a lot of them will say yeah they come from erie but their own traditions and versions of the traditions and perspective of the traditions are different so we can't sit here and try to again discredit people over there on the continent of africa custodians of the true tradition and say they are influenced by outsiders when they are saying it's themselves and again in the article they say that he is wearing a white shirt with the star of david stitched on front that king of Erie points to a calendar on the wall of his own palace that lists the names of his 33 predecessors. 
he has no doubts that Erie is his ancestor. Now, come on, man. This dude has a calendar that goes back 33 generations of Erie kings. And you telling him he doesn't know his history, that he doesn't descend from the patriarch Gad? But this is what you deal with when you have biased scholarship. A real scholar would have came up and said, okay, well, yeah, we have history that says they're there, but there's a better possibility that there's more people there that are not Israelites. And that would have been an argument to be had and that more of our people here are not Israelites or they could have put forth an argument of maybe arguing that it's a small tribal group, even though, you know, that would have been a hard one after this presentation when we showed that just then after 70 AD, that 700,000 Hebrews were spread out over the Roman world and a lot of them came in Africa and settled in the, uh, West Africa. So, I mean, let's just say that a tenth, not even a tenth, let's just say that 20,000 of them went down there during this time period around 70 AD. Over the course of, what's that, 2,000 years almost? It'd be a lot of them down there. You know what I'm saying? A lot of them would be an amalgamated to these different cultures that's come along along the way. But let's keep it moving. It says King Erie, like many, claim that the Igbo are Jews of West Africa. They believe they are descendant of at least one of the of Israel's lost tribe in the eighth century BC. This is an important date. The Assyrians invaded Israel's northern kingdom, forcing ten tribes to exile. Historians say it is not unlikely that these tribes tribes migrated westward to Africa. Throughout history, large populations of dispersed Jews also became lost through forced conversions and cultural assimilation, something that I've been saying this whole time. There is evidence that is scientific that the Igbo descended from the people that evolved in Israel, says Remy Ilona. He began investigating the stories from his youth more than a decade ago. When I grew up, I heard like vi virtually every Igbo here, which they're saying in Agulu Iri, that the Igbo people came from Israel. The Abuja based lawyer says his field work in Nigeria, Chad. Niger and Mali led him to conclude the Igbo and Jewish culture are not just similar, but identical. Man, like he, he actually done field work. I mean, I've heard one of these brothers from this butter knife squad talking about he ran uh, Remy Ilona out of a conversation. No, my dude, look. It's something y'all got to understand. And it's something that I run into a lot and why I got on Facebook arguing with people a lot. It's because when you have scholarship to back up what you're saying and someone is just coming out there throwing things out, hoping something stick or, or trying to challenge you on every point and you can tell that they just really don't know all the things going on. They don't have a lot of the information and they're really arguing from ignorance. What you do is you leave them alone. You stop wasting your time because when a person is arguing from ignorance and just being combative, that's what they're doing. They're just being combative. They're not sitting there trying to come to a point of truth at all. If you did, you would weigh out the evidence, but they know they don't have evidence. So they just antagonize. And anybody who is a self-respecting man who is busy doing field work, which is what he does. They would sit back and say, I don't have time for this and start ignoring you. So you didn't run him off. You are a lot like what the cap says about you. Uh, a nobody to him. You know what I'm saying? Some pseudo guy that's coming alone who just wants to argue. But let's keep going on. In his latest book, Ilona draws parallel between Igbo rituals and custom and those practiced by Jews. Shared traditional practices include circumcising, Male children eight days after birth, refraining from eating unclean or taboo foods, mourning the dead for seven days, celebrating the new moon, or conducting wedding ceremonies under a canopy. Some historians have noted that the Igbo were practicing these customs before their exposure to the Bible and missionaries. So again, 
most of their argument is either Islamic conversion uh, or exposure through the missionaries through Bibles. But they're saying it themselves that that is not the case. So again, are we going to sit here and call these people who are there now being educated in that land liars? Or are we going to accept their word unless you have strong archaeological evidence to go against the history? Period. That is the way history is supposed to be done. It says, Daniel Liz from the Institute for Jewish Studies, University of Basel, Switzerland, is one of the foremost researchers of Jewish identification among the Igbo. He says there has been a clear continuity of Jewish identity amongst the Igbo. It is not just something that happened yesterday, he says. The Swiss Israeli anthropologist says, the Igbo Jewish identity can be traced back to the 18th century. Cross-cultural comparisons have been documented by peoples ranging from George Thomas Basson, the influential angelical missionary and ethnographer who proposed that the word Igbo evolved from the corruption of the word Hebrew to Aluda Equiano, a free slave living in 18th century British society. So again, this is something that the brother has been using, these two people especially, and trying to, to defame the character of these two people, especially to get us from looking at the older traditions, which I've already expounded on. You see what I'm saying? Like, it is very important, like I said, that I have to go through slides like this, which is full of information, a lot of writing that's born to some, but you have to get the background. You have to understand because if you don't, you can't argue with dudes like this. There'll be many pieces of the puzzle that's missing and that they either don't know about or are omitting. And these need to be brought to the forefront and presented, not them putting out a presentation and wanting you to refute them point for point. That's silly. Why would I sit there and refute you point for point when I could put forth a more thorough presentation based on far more empirical data that is what i should do not try to refute your your subpar presentation but anyway the oral stories and historical notations of cultural resemblance between the igbo and the jews have proven compelling enough to lure a diverse array of people to southeastern nigeria michael Froon, a American Jew based in Israel, is planning his first trip to Nigeria to get a firsthand look at the culture of the Igbo. I've read about them, but of course, there is nothing like actually hearing the stories of the people themselves, which is something a butter knife squad needs to take the time to do, he says. Discovering lost Jewish communities around the world is what Friend does. Freon does. He is the founder and chairman of the independent nonprofit organization Sheve Israel. According to its media spokesperson, Arik Puder, Sheve Israel is the only organization in Israel that focuses on finding descendants of the legendary lost tribes. He says the Israeli government does not recognize ethnic communities in various countries claiming to be descendants of the lost tribes. Like, again, if people understand history, if people understand why the Israeli state was put in place in the first place for destabilizing the Middle East, there would be no argument right now about why the European Jews do not recognize the ethnic Jewish communities who have in been many instances are being shown to have more of a relation to the Jews of biblical period than the Europeans who through a lot of studies that are being shown right now, many of them are converts and they themselves acquiesce to the fact that there's a strong possibility that they themselves are converts. Now, let's not convolute the issue and act like I'm saying every European Jew is a convert. I have been on the record 
Many other of the Hebrew brothers have been on the records that we do understand that there will be Jews that appear to be European. And that they will look like a typical European. That is why me, myself, I treat all people with respect because I don't want to take the chance of disrespecting one of my brethren that may not look like me. You see what I'm saying? But the fact that they don't recognize these ethnic communities is because it was never set up for ethnic communities to come and dwell there. That's why they've been pushing out Palestine like they have. It's been set up for Europeans to come and move in. And that's why they have been converting Europeans to Judaism left and right. But then again, you have history of people like the peoples in Ethiopia that go back so far, you can't ignore them. The Limba in South Africa present that J marker, which is not an Israelite marker, but is in a marker that shows that you have ancestry that goes back to that region. And it is most seen in northern Turkey and in the Arabian Peninsula, not as much in the Levant, but it exists. I mean, not as much in that area of the Levant like Israel, but it exists. But again, Jew Israeli government does not recognize ethnic Jewish communities in many countries outside of Ethiopia and South Africa so far. I mean, you do have some places in Israel where you have groups and communities like what they're saying with Shiva Israel, where they're reaching out to these people all over the world to study more in depth and see, you know, what their claim amounts to. But again, the government itself is not big on recognizing these ethnic communities. And this uh, Israeli man himself is on record saying that. According to the media spokesperson, is, is Israel is the only organ. Yeah, again, it doesn't recognize the various commun uh, ethnic communities claiming to be descendants of the lost tribes. They cannot prove that they have a Jewish grandfather or a grandmother, Pruder says, but they do have an interesting story because, you know, uh, as far as, you know, they try to say, well, you have to prove that you have a Jewish grandfather or grandmother. And then, of course, you know, the proof would be according to their records. So you have to have some long, long historical record that dates back to it. But again, we're talking about a diaspora which is supposed to be punishment as the outside motif has presented to us for their sins. And therefore, they, according to their punishment, they will forget who they were for a certain period, but there will always be a remnant that remember. And it seems that Aguluiri is that remnant of the people that remembers. But he says they do have an interesting story, and we're going to find out how interesting that story really, really gets when we dig into that archaeology. And it says, even among Igbo people, the claim to be Jews elicits strong criticism. Again, I'm unbiased. I'm going to present the other side. One critique, Catherine Ocholonu attributes Jewish identification among the Igbo as a result of Christianity brought by missionaries since most Igbo people are Christians. Everybody excited to say they belong to the people of the Bible because the Bible is reigning. It's in, says Ocholonu a prominent researcher on Igbo history and culture. In her award-winning book, They Lived Before Adam, Ocholonu proposes the Igbo civilization is older than that of the Israelites, which is, again, I have no problem because I accept both motifs, the outside motif and, I mean, the aboriginal motif and the outside motif. She feels the Igbo people are whitewashing their history and distinguishing and distinguishing the value of their own culture by attempting to link their heritage to the Jews. Peter Agbe, who says he is a proud Igbo man, which means her trying to say that he's whitewashing their history. I mean, I think I heard Garfield mention him, and this is going to be the first and only time I say your name in my, in my thing, because you mentioned mine once, so I guess I mentioned yours once. But uh, he... He, I believe he mentioned her name. I could be wrong. But uh, this guy who's discounting everything she's saying, because he's saying he is a proud Igbo man and he wouldn't take his time to whitewash or even try to diminish his heritage, strongly disagrees. 
He started practicing Orthodox Judaism in 1991 after leaving the Methodist church. He says that the more he followed the commandments in the Torah, the more he realized that he was doing what his parents had always done as followers of the traditional Igbo culture and spirituality. Now, that is important that this man is saying that, man, because he is a man that's from this area of Guluiri. And he would be intimate with their ancient culture because they are the custodians of the true culture, according to the scholars in Igbo land in Nigerian universities. So because of this, we can stand on what he says when he says that by following the Torah, he realized that he was following the traditional Igbo culture and spirituality. Again, it's not saying everybody in Igbo land follows the Torah or some form of it. But what it's showing is that there are similarities there. There are correlations there. There has been amalgamations there. Again, Eri is not all Igbo people, but he is a progenitor of one of the Igbo people. I have seen that tradi the traditions of our fathers are similar to those in the Bible, says the 66-year-old respect your elders. That's all I got to say on that, making reference to aspects like ritual bathing and polygamy. These brothers need to respect these people who are coming with ancient traditions and not discount them and do the exact thing that they accuse us of doing discounting the traditional history for colonial history because as we can see i'm coming with people from the continent the nigerian people themselves the uh the people who hold the traditions of the ancients i'm coming with them these guys are coming with uh how do you say it uh just a bunch of assertions unfounded just hoping to cast doubt that's their whole game. Can I get you to doubt it and say that this is just uh, different people's propaganda? That this that this people are using propaganda through the Bible or through being connection to the Bible because it's the reigning text on the planet. I mean, that's a lot of what they're saying, that these people are lying, that they would discount their own history for that, for all that. This is how they have to impugn the character of people just to hold on to their point. And when you make a point and you have to impugn the character of almost every person who has an opposite view of your own view, at that point, we all know that there's no truth in what you're saying. These are ad hominem attacks and they are not dealing with scholarship. And that's why the brothers say you're not a scholar. That's why brothers are challenging you on your scholarship around Aluda Equiano. Because again, like Brother Reggie said, you have a deep-seated grudge with us Hebrew Israelites. And a lot of the brothers up there in New York know you have one with me specifically, you and your group. And that when you get in arguments with brothers, you get very, very dogmatic on your biased views of being anti-Bible. And you act as if you are the supreme authority on it. Come on, man, let's keep it real. But you need to respect your elders. When they say this is their traditions, when they have a list of 33 kings to go back on and they say that this is their traditions, without a doubt, they trace themselves back to Erie, son of Gad, you have no place to question that whatsoever because you don't even know who you are. All right, and I'm going to uh, close it off here. And uh, this is the second presentation. Hopefully we can get to it later. But I'm going to end the presentations for now. Now, again, these dudes are masters of omission, and it's just getting old, man. It's getting real old. Like, me personally, I always take a step back because I like to let the elders get out there and do their thing. You know what I'm saying? The guys that's been out there in One West. Uh, the guys that's been up there in New York, you know, Divine Prospect, uh, Daniela Hashaw, uh, Captain Yak, uh, plenty, plenty of brothers uh, that's been up there doing the work. Uh, shout out to Gorilla Hebrew as well. He went up there and held it down himself. You know, uh, I always give them the chance to come out and combat things first. You know what I'm saying? Because, you know, it's order in Israel. Always has to be order in Israel. 
And because of that, you know, I always stayed back. But, you know, the brother said that it was time, you know, saying come out the shadows and start putting the scholarship out for them because they knew it was certain brothers that was, you know, running from scholarship like this. So, you know, what I'm saying I'm coming out and putting it out. And it, the thing is, when I put it out, I don't want you brothers coming up here talking with your emotions. You know what I'm saying? I don't want you brothers coming up here trying to, oh, just throw ad hominem attacks at me and impugn my character for bringing out the scholarship or the scholars. Deal with the information, man. For real. Like, take the time to deal with the information because the next part is going to go into a scholarship and you ain't going to be able to start arguing this. It's going to deal with empirical data. You ain't going to be able to argue against empirical data. So what you brothers need to do is take the time and get your stuff together, man. Take your time, get your scholarship together. Because you can't keep acting like this ain't there. You can't keep acting like the history of Jews ain't in Nigeria. Not only did I show that it's amongst the Igbos, I showed that it's, it's among the, uh, the Yoruba and the Hausa. And these are most of your big ethnic groups in, in Nigeria. I mean, like this goes, you know, without question that this is is there and that uh, y'all just got to come better. Like you can't keep trying to argue like we were not in the various places in West Africa. I mean, we can go into the Songhai Empire with this. I can go to uh, Karnim Barno with this. I can go into Ghana. I mean, I can go into many, many, many places in West Africa. Were they talking about Jews being there? I can I can go with the Islamic uh is Islamic folks coming down there, the historians of Islam talking about how there's Jews in West Africa since before they got there. Like this is just old history. And when I go into this archaeology, I'm gonna do something special for you. I'm gonna deal with what they brought up here when they talked about the Assyrian, the refugees from Assyria, and the Babylonian when they came and they took Israel, because that's important because that's when we get in some of the some of the earliest traditions of Hebrews being scattered out and having a diaspora and going into different parts of the world in order to escape. You know what I'm saying? What's going on? I mean, I know it's hard for some of these folks to stomach too much of that Bible. So I try to stay away from it. You know what I'm saying? Because I like to bring, you know, the evidence and then those who uh like the the elders that's out there, you know, in uh in New York from the RBG, from the One West, uh, even the Old Testament only, they can go into the Tanakh and, and show you where the Bible is talking about this. When 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 God says He will gather His dispersed from beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, that's West Africa. You know what I'm saying? Like, what argument is that to make? Beyond the rivers of Ethiopia is West Africa. Come on now. This has been laid out. I mean, uh, even forget it, man. You know what? I'm going to go ahead and just do the other presentation now. I was going to wait, but shoot, it'll probably take about an hour. So I'll go ahead and do the other presentation now, man, because, yeah, this right here got to come out. It just got to. Man, let's go ahead and get this. All right, this is back on the Israelites in Nigeria. All right, and this one right here, we're going to really be getting on the archaeological evidence of the peoples of Nigeria and how it correlates with their oral traditions and also some of the historical references about peoples being in Nigeria or in the uh, Sahara region. So uh, to start it off, I want to start off with what I consider the earliest evidence in the archeological record for those that we will call Hebrews or Israelites being in this area. And it also goes back to uh, someone who's actually from Mali, who is making this, this comment right here. And uh, so what, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take what he says and I'm gonna see if I can find a correlation for it in the archeological record, because that's very, very important that we'd be able to do that if we're going to make such a claim. We need to present a culture to go along with this claim. And I agree with brothers who say that. So that's what I did. So, all right. 
This right here is dealing with archaeological evidence for the peoples of Nigeria and their correlations. All right. According to the ninth century Jewish traveler, Eldad Ben Mali, or better known as Eldad the Danite, the Ebo Ben Israel may descend from members of several of the lost tribes of Israel. He contended that the Jews of Africa came from the tribes of Dan, Naphtali, Gad, and Asher who had fled the lands of Israel so as not to participate in the civil war between Judah and Israel during the time of Jeroboam's succession and reign over the northern kingdom. And this is, again, uh, 922 through 901 BC or 931 through 910 BC, somewhere around that area. Eldad contended that these Jews originally settled in Havilah. Now, this is important because a lot, a lot of people sit here and, and say Havilah is somewhere in the Arabian Peninsula with some uh, great river that no longer exists. Now, I'm sorry. With the great rivers that are mentioned in, in Eden, it is no way that that great river no longer exists. That just makes no sense to me person. So what I have to say about that is that according to Eldad the Danite, someone who was in West Africa, in, in uh, Mali, he says that Havila is actually the, uh, the Niger River. So Eldad contends that these Jews originally settled in Havila beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, from which the I would call his dispersed. With them, they had a copy of the Tanakh. Now, hold up, this is nine, nine, this is 900 BCs. That he is saying they had a copy of the Tanakh, less the books of Esther and Lamentations, which makes a lot of sense. Because Esther is during the time of the Persians. Lamentations, if I remember, was written during the time of Jeremiah, if I remember correctly. These Jews have no knowledge of the Mishnah or Babylonian Talmud, but have devised their own Talmudic tradition in which all the laws were credited to Yehoshua ben Nun, who received them from Moses. And you can find the story of this in the Moroccan archives. Uh, you can also find this in uh, the Jewish Encyclopedia, Encyclopedia Britannica. I mean, there's so many places you can find this story that, you know, anyone asking for a source on this is kind of silly. But Moroccan archives is the source I use. And then we're going back to Toyin Falola. We've already talked about him and who he is. And we're going to get back to some of his stuff. He speaks on the Nol culture who pops up around this time period in this area. And, and, and there's some good things going on with this Nol culture that's going to show parallels back to Israel. Now here it says comprising of essentially life-size terracotta, the Nol culture which was believed to have flourished between 900 BCE and 200 CE, was, was first found in Nok, a village near Jos in Nigeria. As studies have shown, the Nok flourished in different parts of, Ni in, of West Africa from around 1000 BCE and disappeared around 300 AD. At its apogee, it was a highly sophisticated culture that produced life-size and hollow-shaped terracotta with coil-built head, uh, human heads and bodies. Now, terracotta is something that is found in many, many, many cultures. So it isn't something that is particular to Israelite culture. But again, we have a new culture that's popping up in this area around the 900 BC period, which is aligning with what Eldad the Danite is saying. The terracotta was highly has highly stylized features, is decorated with abundant jewelry, and is formed in different postures. In addition to terracotta, other material remains from these areas included round stone axes, iron axe blades, small stone arrow points and barbs, perforated quartz beads, solid quartz lip plugs, tin beads, pieces of iron smelting furnaces, iron slags, tortillas, and other items. And again, I want y'all to take some time to look at that, uh, that 
that terracotta, man. I, I like that. Look, it's got two twins sitting there next to each other. You know, they're dressed sim in similar fashion. It's real nice. And then this one right here you have a, is actually a warrior that's standing there. And then here we have two terracottas. I, I wanted to show uh, this right here, pillar-shaped female terracotta to our left. I think that's important that we, we show that because we're going to find that this right here does have connection with Israel pillar shaped female figures. And then with the male, we also want to show it so we can see uh, some of the features that are shown here as well. You know, we see people with, uh, you know, Afros, things like that. We see typical West African features amongst these people. All right. In addition to the Nok village where it was found, other areas of Nok culture in Nigeria include Katsina, which is important because that was mentioned in relation to the Hausa. Ala, Ankiring, Akagara, Kagara, which is also, I believe, related to the house of Taruga, Yewa, and Sokoto, which is also housing. Now, this is very, very, very important because, again, we have connections to this area by Jews, which are within the house of community, even though this is said in a later period. But again, when we had the uh, app. Uh, the uh, migratory motif, it is showing that people came at different periods. When we looked at what the Igbo scholars were saying about the outside motif, we see that they're saying that people came at different periods. So they didn't all come at one time. But we see that even back at the 900 BC period, we had people set up in different areas that connect themselves to being Israelites later on in history. So that's important that this archaeological place is connected or this geographic location is connected the note culture it says carbon dating and thermonulescence tests on the note figurines found in 1928 in nigeria have shown that these life-size terra life-size images were made between 2000 and 2500 years ago so that puts it at 500 bc and 1 AD. So we have clear evidence of a culture showing up at 900 BC or around that range, but they don't get to the real life size to around 500 BC. And again, time periods are very, very important. They are the oldest material main remains in West Africa. As, as Graham Conan notes, no culture not only shows that human existence in West Africa has a longer antiquity, but also that the use of iron tools, for instance, those used in agriculture, hunting and protection existed in West Africa over a long period of time. And that's true, because it, remember, in these terracottas, they're using coil coil base for the skulls to design the, the, well, the heads in there. So they're clearly using iron. There's been iron axes found there. So they're they're using iron, but this doesn't really show like this until the no culture. And no one is saying you don't have other evidences of iron being in the area or in Western Africa altogether, but right now we're focusing on Nigeria. And again, this was on uh, page 39. Okay, and uh, again, we still there. Art historians are of the opinion that no tradition of plastic art is in a loose way ancestral to medieval sculpture tradition of Igala and Nupe, Yoruba and Igbo. So they're clearly connecting these to Igala, which is part of the Igbo people, or part of the Igbo people, the Yoruba people and the Igbo peoples. This is clear and this is found in Afri Africa in the Iron Age which is giving you the Iron Age of Africa, circa 500 BC. So anyone who's saying the Iron Age, as far as a, a culture itself, which has been spread out before 500 BC, I, I would like to see the evidence. I'm not saying it doesn't exist, but give us the evidence and show us how it connects to the note culture, as we can see the connection being made here, according to what Eldad Ben Mali has been telling us, according to what uh, Agulu Iris King has told us about them being the first groups being there and then others coming along later. 
like what we see when we're seeing this introduction of iron and terracotta later around about 500 BCE or life-size terracotta. All right. And then uh, we have a book called God's Love Prevails by Evangeline Ngozi, Ngozi Chuku, right, on pages 29, and then uh, this other part is on page 31. On page 29, what Israel and others say about the Igbos. And this is in our publication, and, and it's also mentioned um, from uh, the PhD O. Alaizi, which was also mentioned by another scholar or quoted by another scholar earlier about his outside motif. But under direction of Israeli Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin, in October 1995 and in May 1997 under Benjamin Netanyahu, Israeli government sent delegates looking for a long lost brother, Eri. They went to Nigeria state to state, town to town, tribe to tribe, quietly observed to see if any recognizable Hebraic traits or tradition would pop out. When they made it to Obu God, their research ended as they saw the Igbo there display Hebraicness in their culture. They even saw the stone throne of Gad and immediately recognized the script as Paleo Hebrew. And this was authenticated by the King Solomon Sephardic Federation in 1997. But of course, Israeli government didn't allow it to be publicized. On pages 31, where she quotes, uh, and I do have this source too, Ebo's. Hebrew Exiles from Israel, reprinting Amazing Facts and Revelations by Ph.D. O. Alaizi. And it says, Paleo-Hebrew script has been found in various places in the Igbo territories of Nigeria. Drawings like unto the Magan David, Star of David, have been found in various places of Igbo land prior to missionary arrival to Nigeria. There is a stone throne at Obu Gad, which confirm Paleo-Hebrew inscriptions at the foot of the throne that indicate that the throne was constructed in honor of Gad himself, the son of Jacob. There was also an onyx stone found in Igbo land with the Paleo-Hebrew word Gad on it. Come on, man. This is what they found in the archaeological record. Now, again, unless we're going to have brothers sitting here trying to defame the character of these PhD scholars, man, we, we got to go with what they're telling us. They're from this land. They are the scholars out there doing the field work. I take their word for it. All right. Now, what's important is to show links to Carthage. Because this is very important because anyone who knows anything about Carthage know that it's a Phoenician city state. And a lot of them don't realize how bad over the last course of what has been three, four years, they've been championing Israel Finkelstein and how that this great dynastic period wasn't during the time of Solomon and how it was during the time of Omri. Now, they've been championing this. Now. All I'm going to say about that is because I'm going to have that in a future presentation. They need to update their scholarship, man. Because I've also seen another one of the brothers presented to him, uh, Divine Prospect. He told him that that man recanted on that, took that back, just like he on his neck, on uh, Divine Lex neck. You know what I'm saying? About, oh, well, Petrie took this argument back. Well, shoot, uh. Israel Finkelstein took that argument back and now aligns it with the historical uh, chronology that's proposed by the Bible. So now y'all have an issue because now the Phoenician Empire, that unified dynasty, is 10th century. And by you championing Israel Finkelstein, uh, how great his archaeology is and stuff, now you validated 10th century Israel, David Solomonic dynasties. The Phoenician Empire. You validated that. So, shoot, this is easy for me at this point. But let's go ahead with the links to Carthage. While assessing the evidence from note cultures, Talcote in 1975 suggested that the most likely influence in West Africa seemed to be Carthage. Carthage was founded 
about the end of the 9th century BCE by, by the Phoenicians who had already established settlements on the Mediterranean coast of Africa as early as 1100 BCE. The Phoenicians came from an area where iron was widely used earlier than Egypt. Iron objects started appearing in their tombs from the 6th century BCE. And by the 3rd century BCE, Carthage had been an important iron making and trading center. So now let's look. Iron is in their tombs around the 10th, 10th, uh, 6th century BCE. And by the 3rd century, they're important iron trading. Now, their trade that is linked from North Africa to Sub-Saharan Africa as far back as 10,000 BCE, at least. So to say that there will be no influence there it is asinine. It is ridiculous. But that's what many people try to claim, that there is no influence. But this is clear. Carthage. Carthaginian influence became strong on the North African coast along the Gulf of Gabies, of Gabies, in land and which was located the powerful culture of the Garamantes, and people need to study them. Again, Jews amalgamated amongst a lot of people in West Africa. The Carthaginians undertook explorations along the coast west of the Gibraltar Strait. It has been thought that it was through these contacts with the Carthaginians, Carthaginians that iron working techniques gradually spread across the Sahara to centers in West Africa. Ma Mani Shaw in 1952, Shaw in 1969, and Jim Kerr in 2004. In, ta in Tile Coates' view, one cannot accept the possibility of independent development of iron working traditions in Nok, Nigeria, because West Africa had no pyro metal metallurgical traditions, had no pyro metallurgical traditions. And this is from the dynamics of metal working traditions in West Africa by Kola Adekola, African Diaspora Archaeology Newsletter, Volume 14, 2011. Issue 1, Article 5, by Scholar Works, UMass, Amherst, 2011. In his survey of ancient art, Frank Willett wrote that the Nok created Africa's earliest sculptural tradition outside of Egypt. Like their contemporaries, the soldier builders of, 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 of Xin, China, and Nok mastered the almost limitless cultural possibilities of terracotta. And this is from uh, archivearchaeology.org, no Nigerian African terracotta, right? And it's important that they mention this because what we're gonna find is that the Jews are known to have trade that ranged from China all the way to West Africa to the British Isles. They are known for this during medieval periods. And a lot of that was set up by the peoples that migrated to these areas. And that would be a whole nother long explanation that I hope I eventually get to in the future, fam, for real. Because it's real deep and in depth, like a lot of the history around this. All right, links to Israel. Terracotta imagery in Israel and Judah under the divided monarchy, 925 to 586 BC, right? First, there is the marked tendency to isolate them from other types of terracotta within the repertory to which they belong, most notably the male horse riders. Their appearance is most remarkable, both on the account of the novelty of the subject at the time and relative rarity of male equestrian terracottas in the Near East at all times, right? So the thing again that makes this stand out is that you don't find very male, many male horse riders in Near Eastern terracotta. This is something that is very, very rare. But we do find this under the divided monarchy in, in the lands of Samaria and Judea. All right. And the, the second, there is a reoccurring absence of attention to parallel 
the tension to parallel to combinations of pillar shaped females and equestrian men in contemporary contexts in trans Jordan, S Syria, and Cyprus. And it's pretty much just saying like they're not, they, there hasn't been much in depth contrast between what they're finding from the pillar shaped females and the few equestrian males that they're finding in this area of the, of the uh, Levant. And what they also find in Cyprus, which was another one of the Phoenician settlements that was there in Cyprus. We find them few out uh, all throughout Europe, from Eastern to Western Europe, you'll find Phoenician uh, settlements. And that's important to know. It's important to be able to identify a lot of these settlements because it brings everything into a historical, geographical context of the times. And this right here is found in Idols of the People, Miniature Images of Clay in the Near in the Ancient Near East by Peter Roger Stewart Moray, pages 47 through 48, Oxford University Press. And the, the image you see right there to the left is not from Israel. This is from the Nolk culture, but it's to show that we're finding equestrian art that is rare already in the Near, near East and that uh, does not exist at Africa in this point. We are now finding it in Nigeria amongst this Nolk culture, which is found in other places in West Africa, but Nolk is considered the area where it began. And according to Aguluiri, is the area where Eri began, or his sons began. So now we also are gonna have to show biblical evidence to substantiate the use of a life-size terracotta because you know. The note culture is famous for this, even though it's something that is later in time, but we still need to show something like that. And my biblical evidence is 1 Samuel 19, 13 through 17. And I'm not going to go into the Bible much in this presentation because, again, we know how much they hate them scriptures. So we, I try to stay away from it so they have to deal with the information instead of the straw man or the red herring that will become, oh, the Bible this, the Bible that. But here in uh, 1 Samuel 19, 13 through 17, and primarily in chapter, uh, I mean, verse 17, we see where in Michal, which is the daughter of Saul, when she was hiding David, when they were coming to try to slaw, took an image and laid it in the bed and put a pillow of goat's hair on his head and covered it with a cloth. Now, the important thing to know is that the word we see here for image is most commonly used for a household idol. Now, in order for you to put it in the bed and put covers over it and uh, put uh, goat's hair on it for the head and stuff like that, it would have to be of a reasonable size to be compared to a human. So, I mean, I think this is a clear example of I don't think that it was used in an idolatrous manner, which could be. We don't know. Mikhail did fall off hard. But that's just not put in the story. It's just a huge image, and they call it, it's just a huge terracotta sculpture that they're calling an image. And, uh, and one of the dominant messages that emerges is from the lecture is how uncertain everything is. There are several possibilities about the function of the figurines in society, including simply as children toys, even though a religious purpose is at the top of the list. The one fact that seems the most certain is that the figurines ceased in the areas of Israel and Judah after the exile. And this is done by Grab in 2005. All right. And the source is this is ethnicity and the myth of the reborn nation, investigations in collective identity, monotheism, and the use of figurines in the Yahoo during the Achmenid period by Dr. Isaac. Isaac J. D. Hussler, Approaching Religion, Volume 4, Number 4, December 2014. And this right here, man, this is clearly showing that after this diasporic period, we're talking about the Syrian and Babylonian captivities. This ain't even found there no more, but we're finding it in the note culture, which the note culture has the ability to, within it, have exiles from each one of the, well, from the two, the Assyrian and Babylonian exile. And according to Aguliri's tradition, this is the place where Neri first came, the son of Gad. 
All right. Now we have to deal with 600 BCE. And this is around, again, the time period of the fallout of the Assyrian. And we have the Babylonian that's coming up here soon during this time period. And it says uh, here, Daimo culture describes a small fire clay animal figurines that were first discovered in ar by archaeologists at a mound in Daima, a village in northwestern region of Borno, the lake of the lake, the lake Chad. Now here we're dealing with area that is Hausa territory right here. So the first one was with the Igbos with Neri and aligning his with it. But now we're going to go 600 BCE and we're going to get with the Hausa. Hausa and Yoruba, and I leave them out. These figurines were believed to have been made by a population of Neolithic herdsmen around 6th century BCE. Although it is named after Daima, where it was first discovered, this material culture is not limited to Daima and the Lake Chad areas alone. Thousands of them have also been excavated at Jos which is again the same place where no uh, no excavation took place. Tagina, Ise, and Oyo Ife stay, which is very, very important. I highlined them for a reason. Oyo Ife is a Yoruba, among other places. Again, we're back to Toyin Falola and his work. In addition to this, the entire African continent is saturated with these fired clay figurines. So we go from a period before the note culture, we don't find none of these figurines outside of Egypt. And then while now we're excavating and we're finding them after 400 BC everywhere in West Africa. Others are even found in Zimbabwe, for instance, but they date to about 500 AD. So they even later than that. So it's either showing a migration of this culture across Africa or that someone else brought a similar culture into Africa around four around 500 AD and that also would coincide with the uh with the Alayaman and with the uh the Bayadia the traditions that we saw from earlier that brought them in around the uh the AD periods now, Bukola, Adeyemi, Oyeniyi, which is also a PhD, and he's a professor at Missouri State University Department of History and, special, and specializes in Nigeria, Liberia, Uganda, Rwanda, Sierra Leone, and other hotspots of violence and terrorism in Africa. And his education is from the University of Linden in the Netherlands. And this is another brother that is from Africa. He's an Oyo, very clearly. All right, so now we're going to go off of using actually African scholars here. Now we're going to go into actually using a European scholar who has went in and, look, and looked at the oral traditions and ancient traditions of, P of the Oyo people. And it's going to be some of the house of tradition as well, but on this one it's the Oyo people looked at their traditions, looked at their culture, and found that it is connected with Israel or Canaan, Israel-Canaanite connection. All right. And it says, on the basis of comparative studies between the dynastic traditions of the Oyo Yoruba and the, and the ancient Near East history, the present article argues that Yoruba traditions of pre prevenance claiming immigration from the Near East are basically correct. According to Oyo Yoruba tradition, the ancestral Yoruba saw the Assyrian conquest of the Israelite kingdom from the 9th century and 8th centuries BC from the perspective of the Israelites. After the fall of Samaria in 722, they were, de they were deported to Eastern Syria and adopted the ruling Assyrian kings as their own. The collapse of the Assyrian Empire is, however, mainly seen through the eyes of the Babylonian conquerors of Nineveh in 612 BC. 
this second shift of perspective reflects the disillusionment of the Israelite and Babylonian deportees from Syria, Palestine towards the Assyrian oppressors. After the defeat of the Egypto-Assyrian forces at Carchemish in Syria in 605 BC, numerous deportees followed the fleeing Egypto-Assyrian uh, fleet troops, I'm sorry, to the Nile Valley before continuing their migration to Sub-Saharan Africa. And this includes, this is, um, his focuses are on Nigeria, Assyrians in Nigeria, lost tribes of Israel, migration, state foundation, state conquest, dynastic traditions, oral traditions, and he goes to African kings list. Man, I, I suggest that everyone go and take a look at this man's work and see what he has to put forth because it's supported by the archaeological record with the Daima culture. And that's the reason I showed them. And then, uh, again, like we said earlier, the Erie was supported by the Nok culture, that this is a new culture that's coming, arriving in this area, uh, according to Eldad uh, Ben Mali or Eldad the Danite, who said it happened during the divided monarchy, which would have been during the 900 BC era. All right. And again, the source for this is Origin of the Yoruba and the Lost Tribe of Israel by Derek Lang. And this was in, in, in Anthropos. Uh, 106 in 2011, pages 579 through 595, and this is a peer-reviewed source. And uh, just some background on doc on Dr. Lang. He's a doctor, Troy E. Seme, Cycle, uh, 1974, Paris, D. D. S. Diet in 1987, Paris, Professor Emerit Emeritus of African History, University of Beirut. Field research in Nigeria, Niger, and Libya. Publications include books and articles on the history of the medieval empires of West Africa, which a lot of these is going to shock folks when we start finding out how many Israelites are amongst these specific empires. Ghana, Mali, Sanghe, Kanem Borno. And on the history of the anthropology of the Yoruba, Hausa, and Kanuri peoples. And he doesn't really focus in on the Igbos themselves, just to be fair. This guy doesn't. So I don't want to convolute him with the Igbo argument. He's mostly with the Hausa and Yoruba traditions. All right. And uh, one of his articles he put out also is the dying and rising God in the New Year Festival of Ife. Because, again, we got to deal with Oyo Ife traditions, and we got to see if there's any parallels with the Israelite Canaanite traditions, because we have to remember, he is saying that they are the northern kingdom. The biggest, I would say, straw man that is being presented is that they have to have Hebraic traditions through and through when that should be the furthest thing for the truth. They were removed from their land for falling to Canaanite religions. So if we're looking for anything in their land, we should be looking for Canaanite religions. That just makes sense, you know? And it says here, uh, the, New Year the New Year Festival of Ife, the dying and rising God, right? All three deities participate in one way or another in the process of creating the world which is supposed to have taken place in Ife. The creation myth of Ife can be shown to be closely related to the ball cycle of Ugarit. Now, this is so important, and I know they're going to get mad when they see that name Ugarit, because Ugarit, it, their tradition is not only considered the predecessor to the Hebraic tradition that came later, but also the Canaanite tradition that came later. So both of these traditions find their commonality in the Ugaritic tradition. And it says, on the legendary level, clear correspondences exist between the Hausa tradition of origin and the biblical genealogy of the tribes, both distinguishing between the chosen people descending from the legal wife, which remember we talked about earlier with Odudua, with a legal wife and a non-legal wife, or with Bayadaya, uh, Bayida, Bayida, with the legal wife and a non-legal wife. All right. 
But it says both distinguish between the chosen people descending from the legal wife and the underprivileged sons descending from the slave concubine. According to Ife mythology, the same pattern is found in the groups of deities in the two major parties of Odudua and Obatala, two figures corresponding to Ishmael and Isaac or Jacob. These parallels are not accidental since Canaanite Israelite myth and legend are based on a dualistic social organization in which two clusters of clans stand. Like this is the same thing that the Northern Kingdom did back in Israel. This is the same thing we find in every Phoenician, uh, every Phoenician uh, port that we find or colony that they set up throughout the Mediterranean. You will find this dualistic system of city states, so to say. All right, all right, and uh, back where it says based on a dualistic social. Uh, organization in which two clusters of clans stand. It is this intermediate level of two different categories of deities which allows us to understand the social implications of Canaanite mythology and the derived Israelite legend since each deity is worshipped exclusively by the members of the specific clan attached to it. So here we get to the point where we can see a genealogy according to this scholar, and this has been peer reviewed between Ishmael's descent and Isaac's descent based on the Ugaritic ball cycle. Like this, 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 if this ain't a point to the Levant, then what else is? The topic of this paper is the dying and rising God in the New Year festival of Ife. By comparing the Itapa festival of the religious capital of the Yoruba with the ancient Near East New Year festival, I would like to draw attention to the remarkable numbers of parallels that exist between an African festival study in Evo and a Canaanite festival solely known by its cult mythology. The Itapa festival and the resurrection of Obatala which is Jacob or, or Isaac, the ball cycle of Ugarit and the dying and rising God. We now turn our attention to the pre-Roman North African horizon of Sudanic cultures. In view of the scarcity of North Africa sources from the Punic period, we must consider the Phoenician homeland of the Levantine coast and the surrounding Canaanite region. The most important, again, they tied it to, to Phoenicia. The most important texts were found in the trading town of Ugarit, situated north of Tyre, Sidon, and Byblos, which was destroyed by the Sea Peoples around 1200 BCE. You know, right around the time the Bible is saying the Philistines come into the area. The cuneiform text discovered in the mound of Ugarit provided the most important single corpus of documents for the reconstruction of the Canaanite culture of the Phoenicians. Among the mythological and legendary texts of Ugarit, the ball cycle is particularly relevant for an attempt to explore the festival culture of Canaan and hence the Punic North Africa, because there's no question was the Phoenician Empire in, in, in the land that we call Israel or today or Canaan. It says, while most scholars restrict their inquiry to its mythological features consisting of an a, account of the actions of the main gods of Ugarit, some scholars regard it as a liturgy of the Near East of the New Year Festival. Going one step further, some interpreters believe it to contain a most convincing evidence of the ancient Near East mythological and even cult mythological pattern of the dying and rising God. Although the surviving text fragments do not explicitly mention an act of creation, some scholars by comparing the ball cycle to the Babylonian Enuma Elish draw attention to the scattering of 
of Yam and the subsequent rise of Baal to kingship, and thus bo consider both to express cosmogonic ideas. Now, this is this is crazy because if anything, as much as they say that Egypt is the origin of all this stuff in Canaan and we get everything from Egypt. Why didn't they go to any Egyptian text to draw a parallel? Why did they have to go to a Babylonian text, the Enuma Elish? I mean, we just got to ask that question because these people are trying to make everything Israel come from Egypt when I just don't see it. I mean, are there some correlations? Of course, these are cultures right next to each other. There's going to be certain correlations, but from a governmental standpoint from a spiritual standpoint it just doesn't line up it just doesn't i mean there, are like i said there are like parallels that we can find where you know our cosmologies or ideologies will clap hands but there's other places where they'll be so far apart that it's hard to say that one comes from the other the books of the old testament refer to the corresponding new annual festival the feast of booths only in passing Although the Israelites associated with the exodus from Egypt, the festival must have been had strong Canaanite connotations. From the Mishnah, we learned that the Feast of Booths was celebrated in the Temple of Jerusalem in connection with the early worship of the sun by the priests of Konim. And now, again, we have to be fair during the time period of this. This is during the time of the Herodians. Okay. The Levites on the stairs between the court of men and the court of women behaves as if they wanted to obstruct the movement of two priests towards the rising sun and during the Roman period. Again. All right. Now, this let, let's go ahead. We got to zoom in here. I want this to be seen. The brothers be sitting here acting like. Again, this stuff don't exist out here. See, let's throw that one up. Now let's take a look at this again. This is from the dying and rising God in the New Year Festival of Ife. How do you make this parallel? How can you see this and not show a Canaanite Israelite connection here? We have Ugar the Ugaritic text where El, you have Yom, and you have Baal. Yom is pretty much analogous with, uh, I'm trying to think of her name. I don't want to say her name, right? But the queen mother of heaven in, uh, in the Babylonian text where she gets pretty much slain by Baal and it creates the heavens and so on and so forth. And you find this in the Ugaritic text. And it, it, what it's speaking to is the duality of one has to be slain for prosperity or life to exist right and there's given this same duality in this to the abrahamic text dealing with ishmael and with isaac or it are the 12 tribes of jacob which they descend from and then you find this also with by yadida by by yajida which i keep messing up his name by yajida or really if you want to get to it yahawada but we'll get there later. By a D, by Yajida, who we have him and we follow him, and you got Bagari, who is the son of the slave woman, and then you have Bawa, who is the son of the legitimate queen or heiress, which has so much in depth to do with the biblical narrative behind Abraham. That is crazy, but uh, yeah, the parallels are dead on. Then you have Oludumare. Who has the one son, Odududua, who came later in time and it was with the seven Yoruba kings. And then you have Abatala with the minor Yoruba states, right? And Abatala would be in congruence with Isaac or Jacob, the 12 tribes of Israel. And I just wanted to go ahead and show that, man, because they, they again, they're acting like this ain't what it is. Like this, this is real scholarship here. It ain't, it ain't no one sitting here just trying to pick stuff out the air or just go with it based off faith man there is evidence to substantiate this all right now we're going to move on to the kebi which is part of the Hausa tradition and again these things are going back during the syrian time all right 
And with the KB Hauser tradition, he says this, on the basis of newly discovered documents in Hauser State of Kebi, Nigeria, the present article argues that the foundation of the state was a result of the conquest by Assyrian immigrants towards 600 BC. All the major, which is the Diama culture, all of the major sources of history of the state support this theory. A chronicle derived the origin of the Kabawa from Mad Madayana, a name probably referring to Ashur and Nineveh. The Kanta tradition postulates an immigration of the state building ancestors from Arabia. The long king list has 33 names of kings, just like the, uh, the Igbo, huh? Just like with uh, Aguluiri of kings, which can be shown to ha have ruled in the ancient Near East. Oh, man, this one went further. And the, the short king list concentrates on Kebi and omits nearly all the non-African kings. From the names included in the, the long king list, it appears that the early kings of the Kabawa were, were ancient Near Eastern rulers and that the author of the list believed in the continuity between Assyria and Kebi. In the chronological order, the names refer to the Akkadian Amorite and to the Neo-Assyrian period. The departure of the Assyrian refugees from Syria-Palestine is referred to by the name of the Babylonian conqueror of Assyria and the name of the last Assyrian king. And again, same thing he based the studies on last time because it's the same uh, Nigeria, uh, Syrians in Africa, migration, state foundation, conquest state, conquest state, African king list, ancient Near East king list, tr traces of ancient Near East kings in Africa, right? So right here we have their migration path that they took, which would have been from Nineveh here in Assyria down here to Egypt, and then from Egypt, they came across to Fazan, where the Garamantes are. I keep telling people these are important people to read about them and the history of the Garamantes. And then they came down here to Kebi State, right? So we see this clearly outlined on the map, and it says right here, the Assyrian successor state in West Africa, page 363, right here, man. So let's go ahead and keep it moving. Oh, we, um, it's good this happened because we need to zoom in here anyway. So we can take a good look at this king's list. All right. Let's go up here and take a look at this king's list. Look at this. Gubaru. I know that dude, the leader of the Butter Knife Squad, ain't gonna act like Gubaru isn't a Near Eastern name as much as he argued about Gubaru trying to debunk the Bible. Uh, and then uh, we got other names like uh, look at this Ta Tema, which is Talmuz, which is one of the fifth and Andaluvian kings. Assuming this is before the flood, then you got Zalde, which is Lugal, which just means big man, Zagesi, which is one of the only kings of Europe third dynasty. Then you got Salemena which they are saying is either Shul, which that's is what that means above the S is Shul, is Shulgi or Solomon, which was the son of David, 10th century. And then you got Hamar Kuma, which is Hammurabi, the, the sixth king of Babylon. I mean, we can, we can keep going. Abdu Dan Bawaka, which is Abazu Belu, I mean, like, like I said, man, it's clear, 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 clear that they have uh, Near Eastern kings on their kings list. Oh, I almost forgot the most important one. Bata Musa, which is Moshe, Moshe or Musa, which is the legendary Israelite leader. And there's no getting around that. Now, one of the things that can't be said here, but, you know, uh, is that that may allude to the Beit Musa or the Beta Musa who came into the Near East during the AD period and they came from Babylon, but they are actually said to be descendants of Moses himself. 
So you want any archaeological evidence of Moses? There you go. The Beni Musa. Those are his children. But let's get back to the presentation. But we can see that they got a Syrian king's list. We got uh, Babylonians on the king's list. We got antediluvian Sumerian kings on the list. We got everything. And antediluvian, my bad. That's not before the flood. That's right after the flood. I apologize for that. And then we got uh, this. This article is another article from the same person. Is a uh, house of history in the context of the Near East world, right? And it says in Gobir, the Canaanite cult mythology parent of the Near East, the New Year festival is reenacted quite differently. On one of the days preceding the festival, the shark in Anna. The king of the Ane people, which that should be Ane people. And that's important because now we know in the legend, again, this was talking about a migratory group of people because we see that the shark that Baida had to kill, I mean, not the shark, but the snake is actually the king of the Ane people and goes to see the king in his palace. He brings with him a golden and a silver bangle and also a ram. The meeting between him and the king consists of a ritual combat. He puts the golden bangle on the right arm of the king and keeps the silver for himself. And they both pretend to engage in a short fight. Finally, Sharkin Ane removes the silver bangle and places it on the king's left arm. After that, both protagonists, which I mean, of course, that symbolize, uh, symbolizes the king winning and taking his head and presenting it to the, to the queen. After that, both protagonists caressed the ram from his tail to his head. The ram handed over to the first official to the second symbolically represents the primordial being of which Shark and Anna is the descendant and living representative. Now this, this is so, so important because again, this Shark and Anna is supposed to be the literal ancestor of the primordial being which is really the serpent when you really look at it when you look at it in near eastern text that's why it's a serpent in this story it represents the circle i mean the serpent tradition which goes is a very very ancient tradition it is tied in with the with the uh genesis to a degree it's not something that you look at and see it's from the exact same perspective in my eyes it's from a different perspective of the same story though it's the descendant and living representative the ritual combat fight is in turn can be interpreted as a symbolic confrontation between the forces of the moon, which would be correlation with the descendants of Ishmael or Kabagari, and those of the sun, which would be correlated with Israel and, of course, the sons of Jacob or Abatala in their tradition, which is, would be the name that Isaac would go by. And that's why I think it's important. That one of the brothers, uh, again, I'm shouting out to you, Divine Prospect, because I like to give props to a prop due. When you told the brother uh, from the Butter Knife Squad that uh, th they don't go by the same names. And this is this is clear in ancient traditions. You will have uh, Egyptian king call uh, Assyrian kings by completely different names than they're called in Assyria. Again, it, most of these things have to go with meanings behind names. That is what's important to people, not the name themselves. So the names can change, but, you know, the meanings behind them and what it represents will never change. Just like Bow Wow means take the city back. And then Kabagari means give me the city. Why? Because in the story of uh, between Sarah and Hagar, Hagar, since she had uh, Abraham's son, wanted her son to be the heir. That's the real contention there. But Sarah, because she is actually from the lineage of Terra and is actually to whom the descent has to be passed through due to hereditary reasons, that is why it is presented that way, and that one is the evil, one is the good. It's a duality there of both of these people coming and living in this one area later on in history, which you will find out that Ishmaelites, Israelites, and even uh, indigenous Igbos were all in that area. Then it says, indeed, since Shinkan Ana represents Ka Kabagari or Ishmael and the King Bawal, Isaac Jacob, the, the antagonism refers not only back to the distinction between the Azne or Ane and the Hausa clans, but also to the ancestral division between the Hausa and the Banza states, and thus to the difference 
difference between the Israelites and the Arabs. Beyond the legendary level, the ritual combats between incarnations of the sun and the moon also has vast mythological implications. Apparently, the forces behind Bawal, uh, Bawal, Isaac Jacob, were the deities of the upper world, and those behind Kabagari, Ishmael, were the deities of the underworld. And those, yeah, and with deities of the underworld, not upper world. I don't know why I did that. All right, now let's get to the peer reviews of this work. This isn't, you know, this is the article that is the of the man who peer reviewed his work and what he had to say about it, right? And uh, it says here, two new studies written specifically in this volume, number 12, which is House of History in the Context of the Ancient Near Eastern World, which is what we just went over, and right before that, 15, the dying and rising God in the in the New Year Festival of Ife reflect Lang's developing interest in the cultural influence of the ancient Near East on West Africa and a subsequent undertaking of two multi-year research projects at the University of Beirut from 1999 to 2004 funded by the German Research Federation. So there you go. That's who's funding it. So please don't hit me with the red herrings about who this group is and what they may have been doing it behind it or whatnot. Again, all you're trying to do is impugn people characters to support your claim because you have no true evidence to support it. These projects explore and speculate about the possible links between ancient and surviving cultural patterns, including patterns of state formation in identifiable in the Sahara zone societies of West Africa, particularly in the Hausa states and Kanem Barno, and the civilizations of the ancient Near East, particular those of Mesopotamia and Canaan. So this is what he's saying. Derek Lane is clearly a revisionist who subjects the ideas and conclusions of other historians to intense analysis, not so much to disprove them as pseudos do, but to carry them several steps forward. And that's important that we, that's what, what's the goal of our research. What we're finding here is that the goal of the research now has been, oh, let me disprove someone instead of us, okay, let's look at the evidence and then let's move this forward. But people don't wanna move forward. They wanna stay stagnant. And then they the first ones to talk about, oh, this is why we can't you know, combine with Hebrews because of this, this, that, and this. No, you're the reason you can't unite with Hebrews for uh, economic means and protection and different things like any other city state would because you don't want to see us move several steps forward. And it's sad that someone else who is not African as you purport to be is willing to go to these extent for your culture and you're not even willing to do it. Come on. Y'all need to get y'all butter knives out and sharpen them and turn them into real daggers if y'all gonna come at us Israelites, man. His originality comes from his having taken very seriously the myths and traditions of the origin of the Kanuri, the Hausa, and the European, amongst others. Again, something you guys refuse to do. Y'all won't take these myths serious. What y'all are actually doing is going along with the colonialists that came in and put down their version of West African history. And that wants teach that, okay, these guys' myths and traditions aren't true. They just made them up to explain things around them. But this guy who wants to actually take things forward says, hey, let's take them serious and look at it. And he says he subjects the Dewan, the written chronicle of the Sefu rulers of Kanem, which is very important. This is documented from them. The Baida legend of the Hausa and the old Dudua traditions of the Yoruba, which seem to, when you really look at it on the surface level, they're all the same thing, as well as other relevant oral traditions and the writings of the medieval Arab Berber geographers and historians of Africa. Again, like we say, you're going to have to say that all these people are wrong, which we know it ain't beyond you to try to do. But we know that that's just not that's not scholarship and that's just not even possible. 
that all of these people are just lying. You know, especially when you make your claim around uh, the the missionaries coming into Nigeria. But we got people before missionaries were even in Nigeria talking about Jews in this area. Like I said, it's crazy when you really look at it, but it shows that people are arguing from ignorance, you know, which is probably why uh, that scholar got off the line with the brother, because I'm the same way. It's two two ways for me to go when I see you arguing from ignorance. Hold up, let me let me let me clear this up so y'all can see my face, man, because y'all gotta see me when I say this. It's only two ways to deal with people who argue from ignorance. It, it's real simple. It's either you stop talking to them all together, or you go off on them. You know what I'm saying? And, and, and make a fool feel like a fool. Like uh, a lot of these dudes know that you know, and the reason why. We have people who will come out on uh, Black News 102. Shout out to Sinetta TV. I got to if I'm bringing you up, baby. And uh, I got to say again, I commend you for bringing this brother to task on his claims about Aluda Equiano and stuff because you could have easily slept that under the, swept that under the rug. But it shows that you guys are truly wanting to move forward with us guys, with us Hebrews. And we respect that and we, we're thankful for that. Real talk. I mean, I know a lot of Hebrews ain't going to like that, but it's just the truth. But yeah, anyway, like I'm saying, man, it, it, you either go off on them. And I'm, I'm one that uh, I would love to sit back and talk with brothers and bring present the scholarship and stuff on these issues. But, you know, it's some brothers that you can't even do that with. You can't even talk to them like logical people. Like uh, my brother Jashov, and shout out to him, uh, Genesis 49ers. Y'all need to go check it out if y'all are really big on that Northern Tribes because he – He's good when it comes to uh, research surrounding the northern tribes. But uh, he was in the hangout with us. You know what I'm saying? And it, it showed the way people act. You can come up to him and try to speak to him respectfully and cordially. But people just act asinine because they really don't want to deal with the information. They just want to antagonize you and disrespect you. And this is something that these brothers are known to continuously do. And so, I mean, like I said, man, this, this has got to be. Uh, dealt with in the community and I'm appreciative for uh, all the outlets that are, are making it their mission to get unbiased scholarship out of our community all together. So big kudos to them because that shit got to go. But anyway, let's let me get back to sharing so I can get back to the presentation. Oh, man, blew that up. All right. All right. It goes there. He subjects the, the, the Duan, the written chronicle of the, of the Sefuwa, rulers of Kanem, the Baida, legend of the Hausa, and the Odudua tradition of the Yoruba, as well as other relevant traditions and writings from the medieval Arab Berber geographers and historians of Africa to intense textual, comparative, linguistic, anthropological, and historical analysis. So he took all of these avenues. And although more prone to proving his points by analogy, because I read a lot of his work and a lot of times he does prove his work by analogy, then by provoking empirical evidence, Lang does argue empirically for the transmission of ancient Shemitic cultural pattern to the interior of West Africa through intensive slave trading on the part of Carthaginians, not Ishmaelites, not Christian missionaries, via the Central Saharan trade route. Now, I will say that I personally have an issue with him saying that because I really don't feel like there's a lot of evidence there, but I understand that there's a lot to be explained that can't be explained. And the easiest route of explaining is to say, yeah, they were also trading slaves doing these things. Because Phoenicians were known for slave trading slaves. Like that's what they were known for. And this right here is where we got it from. Uh, this, this was the review work, Africa, ancient kingdoms of West Africa, Africa centric and Israelite, um, Canaanite Israelite perspectives and collection of Published and unpublished studies in English and French by Derek Lang, reviewed by Leland Conley Burroughs, the International Journal of African History Studies, Volume 39, 
number one, 2006, pages 171 through 173. And that picture is not the uh, the cover of the actual uh, magazine which it was printed in, but I wanted to give you something from reference so you'd be able to at least have a point of reference to go look for the article or look for the magazine itself. All right, further ev uh, evidence of refugee migrations. Now, we have this right here article by H.B. Uh, Linden, which is very, very important that we take a look at. And it's it, it says here, the Phoenicians on the west coast of Africa. Let me see if I can blow that up for y'all. little bit more all right all right here we go right here hb harden the phoenicians on the west coast of africa antiquity number 87 september 1948 no problem in the whole story of the African continent is more fascinating as Hanno's account of the Phoenicians movement around the west coast of Africa, which apparently colonized the Canary Islands and went further around the coast, uh, possibly reaching the Cameroons. In brief, the story describes how before 500 BC, which before 500 BC is the Assyrian and Babylonian exile, Hanno set out with 60 ships containing nothing less than 30,000 men and women who were to be planted in colonies around the west coast of Africa to relieve the population of Carthage, which makes sense if all these people are from a Phoenician area. And now they've just went to war with Assyria. They've lost the war. They got to find somewhere to go. They're going to run into Egypt and into other Phoenician colonies. This just makes sense because they were fighting the wars with Egypt. So you're going to run there for help. And the Phoenician colonies are, are in Africa and Egypt is the gateway to Africa. You have to go through Egypt unless you're going by boat to relieve the population of Carthage. Carthage. It would seem that he reached the Canary Islands and left most of the burden of his population there. These presumably provided the basis for the people we know today as Guanches. We know today as the, oh, I went the wrong way. No, as the Guanches. All right. From there, he returned to the African coast and the exact position of his contacts along West Africa are uncertain. It seems possible that he got as far as the Cameroon Mountains and actually saw these in an eruption because he describes an enormous fire rising to the stars, which was called the chariot of the gods. Now, we know this, that in ancient Near Eastern traditions, when we see this, this is often even especially in Hebraic tradition is categorized with being a chariot of the gods. All right, we've seen this even when uh, in Sinai. Matter of fact, not saying that it was a volcano eruption at the top, but when they seen fire and brimstone and all that coming from there, they knew it was the chariot of God. And while the forest and and while the forest for miles around were on fire, it is perfectly possible that Hanno's description merely describes grass fires on the coast a good deal further west, but the central fire in his burning coastline rather suggests a volcano. And yeah, that just that just really makes sense in the long run, man. But you know, like I said, uh, we have people that don't, won't even use this. Hold on, let me, let me situate that and fix that on that photo. We have people that don't even wanna use uh, real scholarship, you know? They just wanna argue all the time. They don't wanna use real scholarship, but let's get back to it. Because when we look at this, Man, that thing's still messed up, but oh well. When we look at this, J.B. Harden, and y'all can go look him up. This isn't no guy that's not to be taken serious. You know what I'm saying? He's pretty much telling us that before 500 B.C., we had someone sell out with the intention 
of setting up Phoenician colonies on the west coast of Africa. So come on now, if we got Phoenicians who are connected to Palestine, connected to the Israelites, and we have Israelites saying they came into this area, we have Canaanite Israelite culture showing this, how can you even argue against this at this point, man? But we're going to see what they're going to do. Are they going to fall back or are they going to keep arguing? But let's go on. It's more evidence. Arian's account and the account of Pliny the, um, Pliny the Younger, along with other historians who doubted it, like Strabo, Ptolemy, and Polybius, which this only shows that this was around in ancient times and people really were talking about this story during ancient times. Because we're talking about back, we're talking what, uh, 300s, uh, uh, 400 BC time period, different time periods like that where we have people talking about this. All right. And then we have the period plus of Hanno, the navigator. And of course, this is a copy of it, the copy that the ninth century copy, the Codex Palatinus Gracus 398, which is the period plus of Hanno, the navigator. And that just means to sell around. Period plus means to sell around because he was sent out to sell around. And you also have Hamilcar at the same time period with about the same amount of ships. He went to take Phoenicians up into Spain, into the uh, British Isles and into different places in Western Europe, which is why you have people claiming about the old Jewish ancestry in these areas that dates to before the first century BC, uh, AD or BC. But they do have two primary copies they have, well, secondary copies they have of this, 9th century and 14th century. And they are based on the copy that was supposed to be held in uh, Carthage in the Temple of Baal, which one copy was hung up by Hanno, the navigator, and the other one was hung, hung up by Hamilcar, the navigator, but both around the same time periods. All right. Again, further evidence. Uh, this right here is, uh, yeah, this is going to be from Herodotus of Halicarnassus in his histories, chapter 4, verse 24, and it's the English translation by A.D. Godley, Cambridge, Harvard University Press, 1920. And it says, I wonder then at those who have mapped out and divided the world into Libya, Asia, and Europe, for the difference between them is great seeing that in length Europe stretches along both the others together and it appears to me to be wider beyond all comparison. For Libya shows clearly that it is bounded by the sea except where it borders on Asia. Nikos, but this is important because Nico was one of the people fighting the Assyrians. He was the Babylonian, uh, I mean, not the Babylonian, the Egyptian Pharaoh who was fighting the Assyrians, defending our people, who at that time frame, the Southern Kingdom was in alignment with them. So they were up in Syria defending and fighting the Syrians in uh, Carchemish, right? So Nikos, king of Egypt, first discovered this and made it known. When he had, when he had finished digging the canal, which leads from the Nile to the Arabian Gulf, he sent Phoenician ships. Now, this is why is Phoenician ships that he used? Like, uh, people keep acting like this Solomonic period didn't, didn't happen, which they bit themselves in the foot by arguing Israel Finkelstein, which proves, which he actually proves it did happen because he had to recant his statement. But now we are finding all of these hints to a connection between Phoenicia and Egypt, which would have been the triple alliance of Hiram, Solomon, and Egypt. All of this is being hinted at throughout history, but these guys want to act like it didn't exist. But anyway, Nikos, king of Egypt, first discovered this and made it known when he had finished digging the canal, which leads from the Nile to Arabia. He sent Phoenician in ships, instructing them to sail on their return voyage past the pillars of Hercules until they came into the northern sea and so to Egypt. So the Phoenicians set out from the Red Sea and sailed the Southern Sea. Whenever autumn came, they would put in and plant the land in whatever part of Libya they had reached and there await the harvest. Then having gathered the crop, 
they sailed on. So that after two years had passed, it took him two years to get around Libya. There was in the third that there was in the third that they rounded the pillars of Hercules and came to Egypt. So it took him three years to do this. Now, again, a lot of our Israelite brothers go in and they talk about the journey that uh, Solomon took that took him three and a half years. Well, of course, I think Solomon went far further than just going around Africa, of course. It would take three and a half years. I do believe that. But it's showing that this trip can take a long time. Africa is a huge place. It takes a while that these people would have to grow food during harvest time, gather the food just to proceed in their journeys. You know, and it said the third round of the pillars of Hercules and came to Egypt. There they said, what some may believe, though I do not, which Herodotus is making it clear he don't believe it, but it's a story that's around at this time. That in selling around Libya, they had the sun on their right hand side, which means that they rounded the bottom of Africa and came back around the top. Of course, if they went from Arabia uh, Gulf to through the pillars of Hercules into Egypt, they had to, which shows that. Nikos had previous knowledge about this, which is why he commissioned the Phoenicians, who were kings of the sea, to do so. It just makes sense. And it also further shows that if after this period they were going to have population overflow, they would naturally send them to these other areas that they went out and made these small colonies on. We see that uh, around this, all in the same time period, we have Hanno the Navigator going through the rocks, of, uh, through the Straits of Gibraltar, going down to at least as far as Cameroon, right? We have Hamilcar, the Navigator, going up into Western Europe and the British Isles and stuff. And then we have Nico around the same time commissioning a fleet to sail around all of Africa and they're having to do agricultural practices as they go along. I'm sorry, but a lot of these people who always talk about the Bantu expansion need to really look at this because it's during this time period that one of the major ways of the Bantu expansion take place. And if they're set going to all these places, exploring these places, that's where they're sending their overflow population that's coming in from the war-torn Near East. And that just logically makes sense. And all the evidence points to that. Uh, going on with it. The Carthaginians tell us that they traded with a race of men who lived in a part of Libya beyond the pillars of Hercules. On reaching this country, they unloaded their goods, arranged them tidily along the beach, and then returning to their boats, raise a smoke. Seeking the smoke, the natives come down to the beach, place on the ground a certain quantity of gold in exchange for the goods, and go off again to, the, to a distance. The Carthaginians then come ashore and take a look at the gold. And if they think it, rep, it, it presents a fair price for their rages, they collect it and go away. If, on the other hand, it seems too little, they go back aboard and wait, and the natives come and add to the goal until they are satisfied. This, this, there is perfect honesty on both sides. The Carthaginians never touch the gold until it equals a value what they have offered for sale, and the native never touch the goods until the gold has been taken away, which again shows that, of course, Herodotus is talking about something that happened maybe 100, 100 200 years before his time, which shows him talking about like this means that they've had a prolonged tradition of trading with these people. If they can explain to you exactly the mechanism of trade they use, they sell up to them on the island, put the goods on shore. When they put enough gold for them, they take them and they go on about their business. This is a good way of not only protecting both sides of a trade, but it also protects your route from being uh, known by other folks, because if they don't know how to go and appropriately trade with them, then they would never be able to engage with these people who would just stay away from the shorelines or maybe attack you as soon as you come up. But again, it's from the same source. <coughs> um, well, I'm going to skip down. 
Now, again, we have stele of these people who were taken into this Assyrian captivity from the Battle of Lachish, right? Which deals with Judea mostly. And those people were taken into captive and a lot of them fled. This is this is even in the uh, in the Bible where it tells them not to flee down to Jeremiah. I mean, in Jer I'm thinking one of them is in Jeremiah where it tells them not to flee down to Egypt because there ain't no safety there, which is why they had to go deeper into Africa. But again, we have the Lachish relief. And if you look on the relief just here in the corner, you can see the Afros on these brothers. But, you know, we have dudes that want to be pseudo. And that's why I have here Tacitus 5, 2 histories. And this is during the first century period. He has to say that many again say they are a race of Ethiopian origin. So the question has to be posed to the other side who keeps trying to say that these are not a, a, a people of color because this Ethiopian term we know is from the Greek atheops, which means burnt faced people. So why are they relating the Jews to having an origin amongst burnt faced people if they are not part of the burnt faced peoples? And I know people talk about, oh, well, they talk about them on an island in Crete and uh, talk about them in other places in Greece. That's fine. Phoenicians had tra uh, trade colonies all over the Mediterranean. That's historical knowledge. So there would be peoples in those areas that look like them, too. Like, I mean, come on, man. Like, the arguments don't even hold water. But let's get a close-up of this Lakish. Look at these brothers right here. You can see the Afros in their half. You can see the af you can see the curls in their beards. You can see the large noses. Come on, even on the other side, you can see afros with their hands up, showing that they're prisoners, showing that they're giving themselves up. Come on, you can even see the these brothers over here to the side who are being mutilated and stretched out on the sides with their afros and stuff. Come on, man. People gotta stop playing like these one are people. These is definitely, even if you don't subscribe to being a Hebrew Israelite, this is definitely one of your peoples. And you can't ride off their history just to be anti-Bible. That's absurd. Or just to be anti-Hebrew Israelites. Come on, man. If you're going to sit here and talk about it, embrace Africa, embrace all of Africa and the cultures on Africa. Don't pick and choose which ones you want to embrace. And then try to act like all others are not African. Come on, man. Let's be real. But that's the end of the presentation, man. Let's go ahead and get back and share my screen. So, yeah, man, that about sums it up, really. When, when we really want to deal with it, man, that, that presentation sums it all up, man. It, it, you got archaeological evidence there. You got historical evidence that aligns with the archaeological evidence. You have uh, traditions and cultural paradigms of the people that align with the Near East. I mean, like, it's so much here that can't be avoided, that can't be ran from, and can't be just, you know, ignored. So what we need y'all guys to do who want to oppose this view, come with some real scholarship. Let's save all of the, the insults in each other. Don't get me wrong. It's fun to jab. We got to make it entertaining. We got to make it fun, throw our jabs out there. But let's not make it assaults on people's character. Let, let's make it assault on, on uh, information and, you know, little, little jabs at them talking about, oh, you ain't researched this good enough or maybe you ain't checked this out or, 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 you know, and calling people out when they biased for real. Like, you know, a lot of that's been going on in the community this past week. And that's, and, and that's good. That's what's definitely needed. An unbiased perspective will bring more people into the fold to really look at it and see these arguments. And when we get it off the emotionalisms and deal with the actual scholarship, that'll also bring more people along to take us seriously, look at what we're presented for, and we don't have to just be this, uh, what they would try to describe as these radicals or these people who don't really know what they're talking about whatsoever. They're just religious zealots as they try to present us. We don't have to be seen as that. There's a lot of history, there's a lot of archeology span and well-substantiated evidence to substantiate our arguments. And we, we got to be willing to present that and not cower from that. I mean, part of us being Hebrew Israelites is that we dig deep 
and that we study to show ourselves approved and studying to show ourselves approved does extend further than the Bible. But it's important that we have a solid foundation in it to understand our culture so that when we go back and we look at these things that's being presented to us, that we will be able to really know what we're talking about, how to really look at the information through the eyes of the people in that culture and how they understood things and viewed the world around them. And that's why the Bible is so important to our history and it's not to be thrown away, but it cannot be the only thing that we go to. We got to go deeper. And that's important. So I want to thank everybody for tuning in, you know, shalom and peace to my Israelites and uh, keep them prayers up for all the people south of Houston and anybody in Houston that have, may have had a tragedy to hit their family or them themselves. Uh, keep them in their prayers, you know, and uh, keep the most high lifted up. Y'all, we got a lot of work to do. And uh, these natural catastrophes can't stop the work of the Lord. So all praises to the most high. Shalom.